ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our session two for today's webinar. So how was how was your lunch? I hope everyone is doing great. Well, at this moment of time, we will have our virtual chat and we I will going to acknowledge the following. Okay, let's start with the following faculty of West Visaya State University Haniwai Campus. Mom Arlina Ungoy, Dr. Ayan Lavinkita, Sir Agu Kavyal and of course, Dr. Rafi Kiva. We would like to also to acknowledge the Dean of School of Hospitality Management under the West Visayas, which is Dr. Lini Lani Quintilia. Hi, Doctor. Good afternoon. Welcome to our webinar. I hope and I wish I had a chance to meet you um, for in person last um, Friday during our faculty orientation at Main Campus. So welcome, welcome. Okay, let's continue with the roll call of the following. I think upon checking, we are only 37 at the Zoom room. May I request to our dear participants to kindly inform your classmates, your friends, your colleagues that we are about to start for our second session. Okay. Dear participants, I, we would like to acknowledge the following state universities and colleges. First on the line is Altavas College, Capi State University, Conteveda Campus, <laughs> West Visaya State University, Haniwai Campus. The Gig City University, Binget State University, National Teachers College, Coleo de Santa Rita de San Carlos Incorporated. Iloilo Science and Technology University Dumangas Campus. Recording in <laughs> Gimara State University faculty and students. San Rafael Academy. And of course, we would like also to acknowledge the presence of Sister Marisa Dacuya, the principal, and of course, the our dear speakers. Is everyone in ready? Welcome, teachers, students, and um, LGU participants, we are very happy to see all of you virtually. I think we are the only few in the room. May we request everyone to please inform your students, your colleagues that we are about to start now. Okay, without further ado, and at this point of time, may I call on our budget and finance chairperson? No, I'm sorry. May I request our e-certificate chairperson, Santa Renea C. Tubalino MBA, to introduce our second speaker. Hmm. Ducky Santa. 
Thank you, Dr. Joanna. Am I audible? Yes, Doc. Thank you. So a blessed afternoon to each and everyone. And we are blessed to be given this chance to attend and participate in this DMBA 402 class free webinar on environmental management. So it is my honor to introduce to everyone our second resource speaker. He spent his education in Iloilo City from his primary up to his baccalaureate degree. He graduated his Bachelor of Science in Forestry at West Visaya State University. He is currently taking up his master's degree on professional masters for tropical marine ecosystem management specialized in protected areas in the University of the Philippines, Los Banos, Visayas, and Diliman under the scholarship of BENR. He has an enormous and substantial trainings attended related to coastal and marine ecosystem management started from the year 2004. He was even involved on in the various trainings conducted by the DENR Region 6. During the year 2011, he started the training on the establishment of the Integrated Information Management System in the province of Guimaras with partnerships in environmental management for the seas of East Asia or PEMC, and eagerly accomplished a training on IIMS query system and linkage to geographical information system module 2 last 2013, conducted also by PEMC. By the way, PEMC is an intergovernmental organization operating in East Asia to foster and sustain healthy and resilient oceans, coasts, communities, and economies across the region. So moving fast forward, he has also completed the training for coaching, mentoring, and right shop for the operationalization of Integrated Protected Area Fund last 2018. Our second resource speaker for today has an extensive and consistent work experiences. He started as a project coordinator of Mangrove Rehabilitation Project and Integrated Coastal Management Program for Guimaras Environment and Natural Resources Office from the year 2001 until year 2009. Also for six years, that's from 2009 to 2015, he has been a hardworking and attentive management staff for protective, protected area, wildlife, and coastal zone of Penro DNR in the province of Guimaras. From the year 2015 up to present, known for being marvelous, the legend, and for being persistent, he is now the chief of the Protected Area Management and Biodiversity Conservation Unit of P-E-N-R-O-D-N-R in the province of Imaras. Dear co-organizers, audience, and special guests, it is indeed a pleasure to introduce to you our very competent and well-experienced resource speaker to share to us his topic on protected area management, the Taklong Island case. Let us give a virtual applause for Mr. Rhett Arthur Arquelias Dayana. Ma'am, I am eligible. Madinig pa ko. Hindi ko pa yun. Yes, sir. Okay, sinagyan na po. Okay, so I will share my screen. So good afternoon for it. <laughs> I was just to present the Taklong case, Taklong Island National Marine Reserve, in behalf of my head, Penner Egay. Kasi nagkakonflict po yung schedule, kaya ako po yung na-assign niya na mag-present mo ngayon dito po sa inyo. 
So I will present for the Taktong Island National Marine Reserve um, as protected landscape and seascape. Yung category po namin as landscape and seascape ay based po sa protected areas sa tabletta assessment. Tinitignan po doon sa loob po ano po talaga yung resources before po i-categorize ng isang protected area. So yung uh, Tinmar po ay located uh, within the southern tip of Nueva Valencia. Uh, may dalawa pa kaming barangay na nasakop, yun pong barangay Lapaz and Nueva Valencia. So yung sa physical description po, uh, may total area pa kami na 1143.45 kung saan po yung palupaan namin ay 183 hectares lamang po. Mas malaki po yung nasusukupan namin tubig na at least may 960.45 hectares. Kaya po mostly yung management, um, more focus kami sa coastal and marine ecosystem. So yung legal basis po, Taklong was uh, proclaimed, Turpus National Proclamation Number no. 525, Series of Right of 1990, uh, by the late President Croson C. Aquino. When the LIPAS enacted last 1992, uh, ito po yung RA 7586 or the National Integrated Protected Area System Act, uh, Series of 1992, ito po yung mga guidelines ng lahat ng protected areas sa Pilipinas. Kami po ay nagiging initial component. And last 2018 po, yung LIPAS nagiging uh, inexpand, naging expanded National Integrated Protected Area System Act. At kami po, since uh, still uh, initial component. So, manalaman natin ngayon mamaya po yung mga process. So, yung vision po, uh, a well-managed marine protected area with stable island ecosystem having diverse and rich resources protected by resilient and empowered communities enjoying civil livelihood and considered as one of the country's premier ecotourism destination. Kung titignan po natin yung vision, uh, ibibase po natin sa Presidential Proclamation 525 sa mission at saka sa definition ng protected landscape and seascape. Yung category po namin as landscape and seascape ay naka-anchor po as sustainable development. May harmonious interaction ng human at saka nature. Kaya po hindi kami purely conservation yung PA dito sa Tiyas uh, Gibaras. Ito po yung uh, as background pa din po. Uh, ito po yung Tinmar ay um, sole nationally declared protected areas in the province. Kasi po dito sa atin may 12 po tayo na MPA and 11 po ay locally declared. So kung titigan natin yung nakasulat sa screen, uh, halos po tayo ay uh, na, yung management po ng Tinmar ay nakadepende sa tao at sa kasa nature. So, isa po sa pinaka-crucial na component sa management po ng isang protected area ay kailangan alam mo po kung ano po yung laman ng iyong protected area. So, dito po, uh, nag-map out kami since 2011. So, nakita namin na yung beach area namin, beach species, beach forest, ay may 65.139 out of 183 hectares. No, at saka may 93 species of plants na nakikita sa loob. At patuloy pa din po yung inventory hanggang sa ngayon kasi po hindi pa naman nauubos lahat na ma-identify lahat ng mga tanim doon sa loob ng Tinmar. Sa mangrove naman po, ah, may area po tayo na 53.500 hectares. Yun lang pong naturally grown. Then we have also a 38 hectares na plantation um, under po sa National Greening Program, mga corporate social social responsibilities and uh, mga partners na other uh, agencies. So doon po sa mga group, may 26 species po tayo. At saka kasama na po doon yung Chrysophora X Lamarki. Ito pong species na to ay makikita lamang uh, sa Masbate at Buhol within sa buong Pilipinas. At ito po ay uh, parang cross, cross species ng Chrysophora apiculata and Chrysophora xylo. So yun po na tawag na makawan lalaki and makawan bato. So para matigdan po natin kung may uh, increase yung sa mangrove cover, patuloy po yung monitoring namin sa mangrove. Uh, first po sa mapping. Uh, yung una po, yung 1950s, ito po yung uh, auto from na Maria. Uh, 1950s topographic map. O may area po siya na 81.9 hectares. Then pag 2011, map out po kami. Um, uh, Bumaba talaga sa field, tinignan kung ano talaga yung extent ng mangrove. At saka yung result ay 63, uh, 53.5 hectares. So nakikita natin na nag-decrease talaga yung area. Just because po, uh, before the proclamation, um, may mga fish fund development no, doon sa loob. And another po, uh, uh, based po sa mga uh, focus group discussion noon, um, nagkaroon ng massive cutting doon sa loob, especially dito na area.
na nakita na talagang nakalbo yung area na to dahil po sa um, fuel production, yung, yung ginagatong sa mga bakeries. And last 2020, uh, another monitoring, another mapping yung naganap, uh, yung ginawa, at saka nakita nag-increase din. Nagiging 66.18 hectares yung mangrove cover ng Timar, at least by 14 hectares na increase. Dahil na din po sa mga rehabilitation purposes, uh, rehabilitation, protection, associated with uh, education and monitoring. So sa seagrass, uh, medyo fragmented po yung seagrass doon sa Timar kasi po mababaw. Malaming, maraming shallow areas doon sa loob ng Timar. Kapag low tide makikita mo, halos walang tubig yung lalo na dito sa area na to. Uh, talagang pag low tide, uh, exposed na exposed yung mga resources dito. So, may nine species po tayo doon na seagrass na may area na 33.528 hectares. So, sa seagrass monitor naman po, pinukuha palagi, tinitignan yung mga cover. Uh, um, nagkakaroon ng mga uh, series of monitoring, lalo na po ngayon, ginagawa po yan quarterly, um, yung pag-conduct ng monitoring. So, nakikita yung mga average Medyo erratic po yung ano, <coughs> yung trend line. So, isisignan talaga, pumataas pa din yung uh, seagrass cover ng Pinmar. Nagiging erratic po siya dahil po siya shifting of sun, seasonal shifting of sun. May mga part na retribunan yung ating seagrass beds uh, during um, habagat season. And they exposed naman sila tuwing <coughs> amihan season. So sa coral reef, so may dalawa pong coral reef. Um, habitat yung Tinmar. Mayroon pong sa malalalim na hindi na-expose tuwing low tide. At saka mayroon din pong na-expose talaga yung French coral. So doon may total area pa kami na 152.78 hectares. At least may 114 species na mga hard corals. At saka 7 species of soft corals. Dito po yung may pinakamaganda. Dito po yung tinatawag namin na takot lapad shoal. At least low tide may 3 meters na tubig, makikita mo po yung coral cover sa ilalim. Kaya lang po, ito din po yung area na talagang wasak na wasak during 1990s up to early years of 2000. Dahil ito yung area for uh, dynamite fishing noon. So ito po yung result ng monitoring sa coral reef. So we have 1990 up to 2016 na data. Hindi ko pa nakuha yung 2020 for last namin dito sa uh, malalalim na part. Kasi kailangan talaga ng budget kapag malaliliman na yung monitoring. So nakikita sa anim na site, based po dito sa graph na to, na may malaki uh, increase doon sa Watchtower, Alarohan, at saka Piagaw. At dito sa, ang UBB, ito po yung, uh, yung location ito, malapit po sa University of the Queens, Visayas, na Marine Biological Station nila. Doon talaga sa tawag na Taklong Island. Isang isla yun na part din ng Tinmar. So may mga nag-decrease din ng cover. So, Minsan dito, yung decrease, uh, uh, decrease ng cover to dahil po uh, facing po to stability. So, hindi po maiwasan at may ma-damage na reef area. So, yung sa ilalim naman, nag-graph. Ito naman yung uh, output sa biodiversity monitor system. So, yung kanilang monitor, yung mga fringing reef, yung na-expose tuwing low tide. So, ito po yung pinaka-vulnerable sa climate change. Dahil ito po yung natatamaan ng high sea surface temperature no, at saka dito yung may maraming pitching na area patuloy po yung uh, pag-monitor dito at least bumaba, bumaba yung live hard coral at least maliit lang hindi masyadong mataas yung decrease niya so titignan nila yung isda no, kung and, gaano kadami yung isda doon sa loob ng Tinmar so dito lang tayo po tuwingin sa biomass sa metric tons per square kilometer na yung kanyang uh, result tumataas. Yung 2016 at least may 42.9 uh, metric tons per square kilometers. So nakikita na dumadami din ang isda dahil po sa protection. Then isa din po nilatagdan namin, gaan po ba, ay, ano po ba yung conservation status ng bawat species na makikita doon sa loob? Uh, like po, general term, threatened, um, endangered, uh, critical endangered, uh, critical endangered, endangered, vulnerable to other threatened species based on DAO 2019-09. So sa mangroves, may dalawa po kaming threatened species. Ito po yung Rhesophora, uh, uh, no sorry, yung Avicinia rompiana or tinatawag natin na api-api or pi-api. 
Then we have the Campos, Campos Testimum Filipinenses or the Gapas Gapas. At ngayon po may additional yung Pempes Asidula, yung Bantigi na talagang demand na demand sa mga naghahant ng bonsai. Sa seagrass po, wala po tayong Triton species. Po pagdating sa corals, ang dami. We have 41 species na globally uh, Triton species under IUCN. So based po ito sa data ng UPB. Then sa beach forest po, we have four. We have the Tao, Nakahoy, at saka kasama na po dito yung orchids na makita dito sa atin sa province, yung Banda Lamellata, Variety Lamellata, na critically endangered na din po ngayon. Madami pa kami doon sa Tinmar. So tinitignan niyo po yung residency status. Saan ba nanggaling yung mga ibo na to? So we have to categorize them to residence migratory, migratory, residence, and endemic. So yung endemic po yung makikita lang na hayop po, halaman dito po sa Pilipinas, while yung residence po, yung nagbe-breed dito sa Pilipinas, po makikita din sila sa ibang bansa. At yung may mga migratory species, yung nagagaling po doon sa Northern Hemisphere, na pag-winter season po, pupunta dito sa atin sa Philippines, para manginain at babalik naman doon sa Australia for breeding season. So dito po, uh, at least may 10 po na as uh, dito po sa avian or yung mga ibon at least may uh, more than 10 species po na endemic isang po lang po dito ang Philippine hawk owl na palagi po makikita kung gabi doon sa Tinmar then ang yung pinakadami po yung mga residents na doon sila nag uh, nines or nag um, nanginginain sa loob ng Tinmar especially po yung mga fruit dove example yung mga pigeons natin nandoon sila kapag namumunga yung mga balete nandoon makikita doon sila sa loob Nanginginain. Then we have the migratory and residence migratory. So sa mammals, uh, halos for residents. More pa kami sa mammals sa mga bats doon sa Tinmar. Ang dami po naming species from island flying fox, large flying fox, to insect bats no, doon sa loob. Kasi madaming kuweba doon sa Tinmar. Then for the reef tiles, um, madami, may mga endemic, mostly po residents, amphibians. So sa conservation status sa avian, may madalawa po kaming Triton species. Doon po yung ating endemic na Philippine duck na doon po talaga nag-feed sa loob ng mangrove. At saka yung, uh, kung nadinig yung Philippine megapod, yung tabon bird, uh, na kapag nangingiklop, doon nila inilagay sa ilalim ng buhangin na para pong pawikan. Uh, madami doon sa loob. Then sa mammals, uh, halos dalawa lang po. Then sa reptiles, yung may pinakadami. Because po, out of five marine turtles... Mag-deliver lang din. 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 yung nakikita sa Tinmar. Ayun pong critical endangered na Hawksbill turtle na doon nagninest sa Tinmar. Yung green turtle, yung lag, ay yung all breedly, at saka yung leatherback turtle. So sa amphibians, wala po tayong pretend species. So sa marine fauna, at least based on the record... 198 species na mga reef species doon sa loob. Hindi pa po kasama yung ibang species. So, subject pa po na i-update yung data. Sa sharks, uh, dalawa po palagi yung makikita yung hammerhead shark at saka yung butanding na lately po, regular na nagpapakita doon sa Tinmar. Then, we have the gasopos in bivalves at saka yung mga uh, yung mga fertile species namin. May apat na giant clam doon sa loob. And, iba pa pong klase ng mga shells. So sa unique features, yung Tinmar po may 18 white sand beaches. So out of 18 white sand beaches, walo po yung open for ecotourism. So, Kaya po kasi po yung sampung uh, white sand beaches ay nesting site po ng ating marine turtles and Philippine megapod. Kaya close po siya sa mga tao. Hindi po siya pwedeng pasukan for tourism purposes. We have all seven caves at nagiging... Uh, nagsiserve po siya na roasting site for four species of bats. So oh. yung Tinmar po, at yung ibang protected area ay talaga may management board. Sila po yung nag-formulate uh, ng mga policies, guidelines, no? na siya na namin susundin na from the DNR kung ano po yung ginawa nila, yun po yung gagawin namin sa loob. So from 1995, uh, since na na-declare siya since 1990, 1995 na po uh, na itatag yung management board, which is chaired talaga ng Regional Executive Director, uh, DNR Region 6. So ito po, sa 1995 may 11 members, then nung 2009 naging 12 members, 
pag nung 2020-11, so ngayon pong 2021, sumunod na pa kami sa guidelines ng Expanded National Integrated Protected Areas System Act na talaga naka-state na talaga kung sino doon ang magiging members ng isang protected area. So yun po, ngayon 40 na yung member. So we have also the PAMBI committees. Before po ipasok isa lang ang isang uh, policy or mga projects, activities within the PAMBI, nadaan po yan sa mga committee. So depende po sa topic or activity, uh, may dalaan po yan sa limang committee. We have the resource management committee, yung mga, uh, yung mga studies, more po sa research, and dalaan sa resource management. Then we have the finance committee na sila pong uh, tumitingin sa income ng protected area based po sa integrated protected fund. Then we have the IEC committee, sila po yung um, nag um, pumupunta sa mga schools or sa community. Then we have the protection, yun naman yung sa enforcement. Then the livelihood committee na siya naman nag-chair yung mga people's organization natin doon sa loob na sila din pong nag-benefits ng mga livelihood projects. So to address the the use ng isang area uh, based on the DNR Administrative Order 2008-26 or the Implementing Rules and Regulation ng ating NIPAS, so ang gumawa ng mga zona doon sa loob ng yung protected area. So the major zones, dalawa po. Yung strict protection zone at saka multiple use zone. Yung strict protection zone, ito po yung mga nakapula. Nakapula na box. So yung strict protection zone po ay uh, yung allow lang po na mga activities ay research at saka monitoring. Wala na pong ibang allow na activities except for that. Then yung multiple use zone, masyadong malaki. So out dito sa mga pulang box, masyadong malaki yung uh, multiple use zone. Kaya ang ginawa namin, nilagyan namin ng mga sub-zones no? para ma-address namin yung mga needs ng bawat area. So una po, we have the fishing zone, yung color blue. Kaya kasabi ko kanina, hindi kami... Purely conservation, kasi po kailangan ng uh, harmonious interaction ng human sa ka nature. So dito po sa fishing zone, yung allowed lang po ay yung traditional fishing. Especially yun po yung uh, um, hawking line and long line. So uh, sa local, yung pamunit lang at sa kalabay, no, yun na yung allowed doon sa loob. At saka dito lang sa kulay na blue, pwede kang magpagpangisda. Then another po, we have the gleaning zone kasi kailangan din nilang kumuha ng mga shells. Um, pwede din sila nilang kabuhayan. So dito lang po sa mainland, sila pwedeng makapag-glean. Uh, no, hindi po sila pwedeng tumawid sa mga isla. Then another po, we have the seed production area, itong kulay green. At dito pinukuha yung mga quality seeds or pre-use. Under po to sa project ng uh, ecosystem research ng DNR. So, na inventory po lahat ng mga kahoy doon sa loob at saka pinili po talaga kung sino po talaga yung uh, mga quality na mother trees. Then we have the restoration zone. Itong parang kulay pink. Uh, dito po yung mga projects, yung mga rehabilitation projects, um, national breeding program, mga CSW ng mga ating uh, private uh, partners. Then we have also the mariculture zone. Dito po nila nalagay yung um, ngayon, seaweed culture. The project ng mga Uh, POs natin uh, within the two barangays. Then we have also official docking area and navigational zone, yung kulay blue po. Yung kulay blue dito lang po dumadaan yung mga pangka na malalaki sa three-gross tonnage. Then yung mga, yung isang kulay, uh, ito pa from yung light na uh, kulay. Dito po dumadaan yung for ecotourism purposes. May sarili po silang daanan. Hindi ka po pwedeng kung ikaw po yung uh, nagbabiyahe doon to cater or to accommodate the visitors, hindi po pwedeng kung saan-saan ka lang pupunta. May mga designated po na area na pwede mo lang pasukin o daanan. Then, paggawa po ng management zone, isa po ang strategy para po um, talagang ma-accept ng community kung ano ang dapat gawin sa loob ng TINMAR. Dahil po, one of the issue noon, 1990 to 2011, Uh, poor governance. Talagang mababa yung governance ng Tinmar kasi po walang acceptance sa tao yung pag-establish ng isang uh, ng, uh, protected area. So yung ginawa namin, binalik namin sa una. Kung ano man dapat gawin, anong plano, anong pinapulit na mga plano, yung ginagawa doon na activities, nadaan talaga sa community. So we presented the management zone, the proposed management zone doon sa community. Alos 11 barangays yung pinagdaanan before pa-approve 
yung management zone. Then, pagkatapos ng management zone, pag-approve naman po ng management zone, gawa naman kami, formulate naman ng management plan. At yung management zone, yan po yung major input doon sa plano ng INMAR. So, pagkatapos gawin ng plano, lahat ng workshop, uh, right shop, daan ulit sa community. So, pinikita naman kung ano yung plano, kung approve sa kanila or kailangan may suggest sila o pwede pang idagdag. So, dumaan naman ulit yan sa masusing uh, proseso. Then we have the enforcement. Ito po yung pinaka isang importante sa pag-manage isang protected area. Kasi alam naman natin kapag PA, uh, madaming isda. So yung tao kapag gutom talagang papasok yan sa PA, mga isda, o lalo na yung mga illegal fishers. So isang mga uh, strategies, um, nilideputize po yung mga communities through wildlife enforcement officer. Then, train din po sila with the VFAR ng fleet for um, fishery law enforcement. Then we have a MOA with the Nueva Valencia, Nueva Valencia na pwedeng um, doon po gagawing substation ang Inmar ng ating mga bantay dagat. Then we have also a partnership with the Philippine National Police and naglagay ng watchtower na doon po uh, naka-station uh, naka yung ibang staff natin to monitor kung ano ang nagaganap tuwing gabi kasi makikita mo po doon uh, halos lahat ng open area doon sa watchtower. Then also, uh, we also installed uh, marker voice para malaman nila nga hanggang dyan yung boundary ng protected area natin. So, isa ding strategy yung communication, social marketing. Hindi po kailangan na nandyan lang lahat sila yung staff sa loob ng PA. Kailangan lumabas. So, makipag-usap sa community. Anong problema? Ano ang mga kailangan? Ano pang kailangan gawin? So, yung ang isang strategy para makapag-communicate uh, kami lahat. Gumagawa kami ng parang uh, tuwing anniversary para may um, festival. No? Lahat ng mga communities doon sila sa Piagaw Island. Mayroong mga search, may mga sports na mga competition. No? At least, uh, para kamaradari yung uh, talagang objectives. Then we have also the mascot or what to say the flagship species. We have the pawikan, we have pawpaw the pawikan, ito po. At saka si Banban the Balagan. Sila po yung Uh, flagship species ng Tinmar kasi po yun po yung palaging makikita doon sa loob ng Tinmar. So sila po yung dinadala naman ito saan-saan kapag may mga um, uh, programs or mga activities. Then we have also um, uh, nagbigay din po kami ng mga uh, calendars, then mga comics. So isa din po, naglagay din po tayo ng mga signboards kasi kailangan po kahit na alam nilang protected area protected area yung area, po kailangan tuloy-tuloy yung communication, tuloy-tuloy yung IEC no, para hindi mawala sa isip nila, hindi nila malilimutan. Then we have also the logo. So ito pong onang logo ay based po to, uh, ito po yung nanalo noong 1994 na contest. Parang uh, whole Philippines na contest. But ngayong 2000, uh, pinalitan po nila. Ginawa nilang mas high-tech yung logo ng Inmar to the help of our rear and uh, BMB, the, the Biodiversity Management Bureau. So, isa din po namin ginawa, kailangan i-capacitate po yung mga stakeholders, lalo na po yung Protected Area Management Board po natin na sila po yung nag, talagang nag-manage ng ating Protected Area. Ginala po kami nila sa iba't ibang uh, mga protected areas, mga marine protected areas, para makita din po namin kung ano po yung mga good practices doon. At saka pwede namin ma-apply doon sa Taklong Island National Marine Reserve. So pumunta kami sa Apo Island, sa Olango Island, no, tinag namin kung ano na yung management strategies nila. So si livelihood, dahil po affected yung mga tao noon nung mag nung in-establish yung protected area. Marami pong displaced na fishers, lalo na po yung mga marginal fishers natin. Kaya kailangan is-supplement po natin ng livelihood. So isa po yung binigay yung catering services kasi po uh, nakapasok na yung Tinmar as ecotourism circuit no, ng Western Visayas. So I mean, capacitate, binigyan, binigyan po ng training yung bawat POs sa catering services. Hindi lang po training. At alam binigyan din sila ng DNR ng mga gamit na pwede nilang gamitin kung mga mga magpapakater po sa kanila. Then another po, um, binigyan po sila ng mga weaving, pandan weaving, and isa din pong um, livelihood, yun pong pagkuha na po pag-use ng mga POs at saka binibenta nila sa iba namang barangay dito sa probinsya. So ito po yung um, 
tourist arrival per year ng Pinmar since 2008. So, pinuha namin yung data. So, talagang medyo pataas since uh, hanggang 2017. Dahil alam natin, 2017 yung nag-close yung Boracay. Halos dito sa Gimaras pumunta yung mga turista. Then, pag 2018, medyo bumaba sa 2019. Then, 2020, mas lalong bumaba dahil po natandaan natin yung August na um, accident ng uh, mga boats doon sa Hordan. Talaga bumaba, pumasok pa yung ating uh, pandemic. So ngayon, 2022, unti-unti na pong bumabalik ang mga bisita. So yung aming tourism po, activities ay based naman po sa Ecotourism Management Plan with approved by the Regional Ecotourism Council. So hindi po kami pwedeng maglagay ng isang activity na wala po sa aming plano. Then, ang nagsusupport po ng budget ng TINMAR ay DNR po. So, ito po yung budget na nilagak ng DNR every year. So, at least we have uh, 2 million to, ngayon bumaba to 1.4. Then, we have also IPAP, the Integrated Protected Area Fund. Ito po yung, uh, yung source of income po namin na generate ay mula po sa entrance fee na 30 pesos for the adult, 15 pesos for the student, and 100 pesos for the foreigner also sa protected area. Then we have also the duck fee. Yung ducking fee po namin kapag taga Barangay La Paz po at sa San Roque ng mga boats na mga registered sa marina na biyobahe doon ay free po sila sa ducking fee as part po ng um, benefits sa kanila. As part po kasi sila yung mga affected na figures natin kaya wala na po silang bayad. Even sa intense fee po, wala din pong bayad yung taga La Paz and San Roque. So as of now po, may mga 1.048 million na po kami na naipon. Then yung 25% po nun ay papasok nun sa Department of Budget. No, yung 25%, siya naman po yung gamitin ng ibang protected areas na bago pa lang na established. So, parang ang bag natin yun. And the 75%, na-deposit po yun sa land bank dito po sa province of Gimaras na siya naman pong gagamitin natin for the operation ng ating protected area. So, we have the MET. We have to evaluate. Uh, mostly, um, ano na ba ngayon hanggang sa... Uh, So, meaning, hanggang saan na ba yung protected area? So, nung 2011, so the GIC or GTZ conducted the MET, the Management Effectiveness Assessment, no? and nakascore lang kami ng 30.50. So, mostly yung kinupuha dito, ang questionnaire ito eh, uh, you have to answer yung enforcement na side, yung uh, mga habitat na side, na increase ba, na decrease ba, yung participation ng community at gaano active yung management board doon sa isang protected area. Then after that, ng 2016, kumuha, kumuha ulit ng MET, yung JIC pa rin yung nag-sponsor, tumaas na to 94.20%. So sa governance, so we have 12 so hindi pa nga na-update na ng ating data. So gumawa, nag, ano po, mayroon po tayo dito sa province ng Gimaras, ng Gimaras Alliance of Protected Areas and sanctuaries. Then, isa po yung TINMAR sa member doon. Yung target po sa alliance ay yung social pa lang. Uh, mga nagpapakita ng mga best practices and every MPA para magamit naman ng iba MPA o ma-apply nila sa kanilang protected area. Then, ito man po yung sumila. Na umupo po kami with um, uh, Congresswoman Naba no? para for the um, PA bill. So, para magiging ano tayo, full-fledged na protected area under INIPAS. Kasi po sabi ko kina, kanina, initial component pala yung yung TINMAR. Kaya po, ang ginawa namin, talagang dumaan po kami sa butas na kayong from bar Barangay Council pataas po sa regional level na mga economic development council dinaan na namin para makapasa po yung TINMAR for the legislation. So, ito po yung una, pumunta po dito si... Uh, Government, then si Kong, uh, we presented the full file of TINAR, paano po yung mga plano. And after that, ito na po, uh, umupo na pa kami sa, may, uh, sa cabinet session, sa committee, no, kung saan ni-review na yung PA bill ng TINMAR. So, tinilanin po natin yung benefits. Ang tagal-tagal na lang TINMAR, pang 20 to 20, 23 na ngayon, ilang years na halos. Then, um, well, makita natin ano lang benefits in terms of fishing. May nakukuha ba yung communities? So, 2015, this is only a 2015 na survey. So, we conducted the catch per unit effort na survey. So, sa isang type lang ng fishing gear. So, kumukumas lang, this is a, a, a long line, a long line method. 
So yung may mga target fish na yung hindi ko maano yung common name ko yung tatawag ng liwit. So those time yung kilo 180 na 2015 ng atong klasing isda. So based sa fermentation based result at least po may kinikita sila within 4 hours na pangingin isda outside Tinmar. At least 5 meters away lang sa boundary. No kumukuha sila ng uh, nagkumikita sila ng 250 per day. At least nakakatulong na within 4 hours na lalabas sila ng 4 o'clock in the morning then babalik sila uh, after uh, mga 8 o'clock naman in the morning. So ayan po. Then isa pa po, may project din po doon na floating cottage. Uh, this was funded first by the Lincoln Ramamilya by late uh, Gina Lopez. No, siya po yung nang nag-fund ng floating cottage doon sa loob ng Tinmar. So binigaya sa isang um, EOs, yung Sarsepa, tinignan kung uh, i-income talaga yung project. So sa loob ng 3 years, wala pong binabayadan EOs sa loob as a uh, special agreement for protected areas yung SAPA kasi kailangan kapag income generating yung project you have to share naman for the IPAP. So do nakikita ang laki ng income. So dito uh, first year pa lang may 300 plus thousand pero mag second year 871 kailan naapektuhan din sila during the pandemic at ngayon balik naman sila sa operation. So malaki malaking tulong sa community yung project na to. Sa ngayon po may dalawa silang floating cottage. Isa po yung funded ni Ma'am Tina at isa po yung uh, ibinigay sa kanila ng DNR. Then dahil po sa mga ganoong um, activities and management na ginawa ng ating management board, una po um, nagiging uh, first runner-up yung TINMAR sa community basis for tourism, doon po sa ATOP sa tourism. Parang dalawang uh, year 2015 to 2016 then pag tw nung 2017 po uh, yung Tinmar po yung first na nanalo sa para Elmar or for the sea na contest dito po sa uh, dito sa buong Pilipinas um uh, based po sa category ng NIPAS so kami po yung first na nanalo doon sa para Elmar as champion then isa din po uh, na, May dalawa na pong international event na na-held doon sa area. Yung una po yung SEAN Summit Delegates Luncheon Meeting with April 20, 2017. Then followed by the East Asian Summit last November 30, 2018. So may may challenge po. Kasi po, uh, kanina sabi ko, base, yung category po, base sa protected areas, sabi ko, assessment. Then, noong 1994, yung unang result po ng TINMAR ay protected landscape and seascape. Then, we update the PASA as 2016. So, nakita na ang dami palang treatment species doon sa loob from uh, wild fauna to flora. So, naging, nakapasa po siya as natural park. Now, ngayon, yung natural park po ay hindi allow yung extract, extraction ng mga resource doon sa loob. So, ma-effect na kita yung ma yung fishing. Kasi di ba, open ka kanya, hindi sa purely conservation. But yung ginawa po namin, gumawa, in-update naman, mag -a update kami ng zona. Still, may fishing zone sa, may fishing zone pa din, but ipapa-approve namin sa Congress yung aming uh, bill. Pagkatapos, doon sa bill, nakaloob na doon yung my fishing area kami sa Tinmar. So ito na po ngayon ang proposed na Republic Act ng Tinmar, yung sa kanyang PA bill, yung RA number 83335. At saka kapag nakapasa or na-approve na po sa Congress this year, uh, mapapilita na po yung pangalan niya, magiging Taklong and Tandog Group of Island Natural Park. So sa mga issues, oh, ngayon po, tuwing habagat, ang daming ways Dirted ways, no, made uh, mga foreign ways, and daming pit battles from Malaysia, Borneo, Brunei. So, na po mapasok sa Tinmar. Kapag habagat, talagang wasak na wasak si Tinmar sa mga uh, ways na mula sa dagat. Then, hindi din, so, mga action, yun po, or yung cost tin up, ngayon po yung issue, they deliberate na ngayon sa PAMB for possible additional action. Then, CUPB po ay nagsasadi ngayon sa waste branding and characterization. Tinitignan po namin if pwede pa tayong uh, makahingi ng danyos or any incentives po sa mga countries na pumapasok yung kanilang waste sa Tinmar. So, hindi din po maiwasan na isang challenge po yung fishers, mga encroachments ng fishers. Lalo na po kapag pandemic, talagang grabe po yung nangingisda sa loob. Alam po natin, maraming tao na nawala ng sambaho 
during the time niyo ng pandemic. Kaya yung nag-ship po sila sa fishing, umuwi po doon sa Bayanggay, from Bayanggay La Paz, San Roque. Yan, doon na po nang isda sa loob. But still, uh, kailangan po nating uh, i-educate yung tao na yung pinapasupan nila ay protected area. Yan, hindi talaga ngayon may wasan climate change. So, talagang grabe yung impact ng climate change. Ngayon, noon, hindi, hindi nakakaabot yung tubig uh, doon sa Pegao Island. May parang boundary kami, yung tinitaga namin, yung pandan. Tumutubong pandan. Hindi yun umaabot ang tubig noon sa mga 2015. But ngayong 2022, halos um, abot na abot niya na yung puno ng mga pandan na yun. So yung ginagawa ngayon, Protectors of Coastal Marine Fishing and Protect City, ADAC-TV, yun na po yung magagawa natin. Hindi talagang proteksyonan talaga, practice, magiging complex, hindi po siya madaling praktuhan, at saka yung habitability ng isang ecosystem ay hindi mula, at saka conserve blue carbon story. As part of it, pag nag-protection mo sa ecosystem, yung blue carbon story po ay ma-proteksyonan mo din. Yung blue carbon po, ito po yung sa seagrass at saka mandu. Then, regular monitoring. Solution. So we have to monitor and evaluate ano po yung impact ng climate change. Then we have to anchor sa result ko ano naman yung management strategies na gagawin natin po doon to all sa ecosystem or sa bawat area po natin. So thank you po. Ganun lang po. Maraming salamat at magandang hapon po ulit. Hello? Hello. Hello. Sure the yes, sir. After four. I one moment, ma'am. She was being Um, I think we need to stop the share screen of our speaker. Share. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Diana, for that very informative talk to everyone. Well, we are very happy and we are very honored that we, you were able to grant us your time um, to be our resource speaker. Well, at this moment, point at this moment, may I call on Miss our e program chairperson, Mainen G. Lubugin, MBA, for an open forum. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Doki Johanna. Good afternoon. Dear participants and our guests, um, thank you. I would like to thank our speaker, Mr. Rep. Arthur Diana, for your profound and very informative talk on the topic protected area management, the Taklong Island case. So, Pastor, Personally, I am very impressed of the program that you have with uh, Team NAR and how you were able to protect the islands and at the same time uh, help the locals to have their livelihood. So at this juncture, uh, the floor is now open for the open forum. I am pretty sure that uh, Mr. Diana is now ready to answer your questions. But before we start the ball rolling, May I remind the participants that if you want to ask our speaker personally, please raise your hand using the icon on your screen to be acknowledged, or you may type your questions in our Zoom chat box and I can read it for you. Kindly identify your school or your organization and your name. Okay, so um, as what I've said, the, the, the floor is now ready for the open forum. Anybody from the participants who wants to ask our speaker? Okay, so we have here, um, 
a guest participant from Capsu Capiz State University. Uh, Miss Jo, what's the name again? Okay, so kindly uh, unmute your phone and ask our speaker for your question. Excuse me, are you there? From Capiz University, I have seen your hand raised earlier. Do you have, are you ready with your question for our speaker? Oh, uh, maybe she uh, is not, or she has, uh, there is a problem with her connectivity. So may I call on Dr. Roslyn of, of one for her question. Dr. Roslyn. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Mainen. Uh, hindi lang Dr. Anna. <laughs> wala pa wala pa katapos okay. good afternoon sir Diana hi ma'am um, so your talk about the Taklong Island in Guimaras was very interesting indeed because I am from Iloilo so I have always uh, like or there is um, I would like to visit Island, Taklong Island actually but I think uh, is it open for everyone to come or do you need to apply to go to the what's this the municipal user? Okay, ma'am, pwede po kayong makadiretso doon sa Barangay La Paz. Doon po yung entry point namin sa Sitio Almansur, Barangay La Paz. Doon po sa Nueva Valencia. Then doon po may mga POs po tayo na nag-accommodate ng mga visitors. Sila din po yung mga marina accredited natin ng mga pump boat operator. Sila po yung mag-guide sa inyo papunta po doon in Mar. So community na po yung nag-manage in terms po ng ecotourism doon sa Tinwang. Walk oh, okay. in a point so, na po pwedeng magpabook. Ah, okay. So, pwede, uh, it's okay to come there. Or, ay, di na mag pwede walk in, sir. Yes, ma'am. Pwede na po walk in. So, I'll take note of that, sir. Anyways, this is my question po. Um, what are the factors or aspects that needs to be considered for a place uh, to be regarded or uh, placed under as a protected area po. Are there some set criteria to be um, considered po? Yes po ma'am. Uh, based po sa uh, kailangan po talaga dumaan po yun sa mosusing assessment, sa mabusising assessment, if uh, we have to declare a protected area. Uh, tinitindan po talaga, in case po ng terrestrial, terrestrial, eco terrestrial ecosystem po yung target natin, tinitindan po ano po yung importance ng isang area, ano po yung binibigay niya doon sa ating ekonomi. So lahat po yan titignan. Ano po yung mga species na dapat nating uh, protection. Kasi po mostly, nag uh, de declare po ng mga protected areas if marami po yung mga threatened species natin doon po sa loob ng isang area. So yan po yung unang factor, yung mga threatened species talaga yung titignan. Then ikalawa po, yung, ano po yung tinutulong ng socioeconomic, lalo na po watershed area. No, kailangan din po yun para maproteksyonan yung mga source ng ating mga tubig to supply sa community. Then, another po, um, mag base naman po yun sa kategory ng isang PA. Based assessment po, titignan kung saan siya magpo-fall na category base po yun sa result ng assessment. Then, pagkatapos po, kailangan po uh, may acceptance doon po sa local government unit. Kasi po, dalawa po yung declare na protected area. Uh, isa po, pwede po nationally declared as a case ng TINMA, uh, declared po sa base po sa presidential proclamation. Then, pwede din po declare ng isang protected area yung local government unit through locally declaration, through local declaration po. Okay, Sir Diana, follow-up question lang po. So, sa pag ano po, pa, is for, before ma-declare po protected area, are there um, uh, ang, yung initiative po na ma-evaluate as a protected area will be coming from the government itself? Run out, ma! Bawagan ko na ka gamit. Pardon, ma'am. Hindi ko na manindig, ma'am. Okay, ulit, ma'am. Yes, sir. Uh, are, uh, 
for the uh, for an area to be placed or to be regarded as a protected area or ang um, initiative po ba will be coming from the government or the people in that area will be the one to apply to Pwede be a protected area. Government. Pwede din po from the people nga mag-apply. Kasi po kailangan yung assistment uh, po 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 ng um, national government. Example po din, uh, the local government. And especially po hindi po mamawala yung academic and representative ng bawat local communities. Sila po yung mag-conduct ng assessment kasi po isa pala yung mamawala. Mawala din po yung acceptance ng isang grupo kapag hindi po sila na-involved doon sa process ng pag-declare ng isang PA. So napaka-importante po din yung, yung um, representative ng community, lalo na po kapag may mga uh, indigenous people. Okay sir, thank you very much for answering my question. So, thank you. Back to you to be painted. Okay, thank you so much, sir Diana, for that enlightening answer to the question of uh, Ms. Roslyn. Okay, so before I proceed with the next uh, question, I would like to read this uh, message from, coming from Angelo Noel Manuel. Thank you. Uh, this is for you, Sir Diana. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. It will be helpful for my personal growth. Okay, so he is very... Um, is very happy for your sharing. Okay, so next. Um, okay, may I call on uh, Miss Saibel and Ramirez for her next question. Um, good afternoon, Sir Diana. Um, my question is, um, in our city here in San Carlos, so, um, some of my fourth year students are conducting a study on community-based tourism and sustainable tourism in Sipaway Island, which is part of San Carlos City. Now, one of their struggles in their study, po, sir, is also um, encouraging the locals to accept this kind of development, knowing that um, Taklong Island um, in Guimaras um, has already been awarded uh, um, in community-based tourism. Um, what would be your advice, po, sir, to our students who are conducting this study so that they may be able to encourage locals to accept um, community-based tourism as well as uh, sustainable tourism? Okay. <laughs> yung, uh, may ask from yung Sipawa Island is also a protected area? I am not so sure, sir, the... Um, as of now, it is only considered as one of the most visited places in Negros Occidental, but there are um, parts there that they are planning since uh, there has been sightings of dolphin activity po just recently. So uh, the LGU is still considering po to uh, have that area protected, pa po, sir. But for now, I haven't heard pa po if there are areas in Sipaway Island other than um, it's open for tourists. So that's the only thing that we, we also would like to ano, sir, ma, to so, consider. Thank you, ma'am. Ah, kasi po yung in, sa case po ng Kidmar as a protected area, um, yun po yung mga uh, community na uh, talagang involved doon sa ecotourism activities namin. At sila, sila po yung naapektohan ng mga teachers. So yung encouragement na binigay namin na ito po yung kapalit ng kanilang nawala na livelihood na pangisda. So talaga yung tao kasi po, uh, wala na silang mapa, mapagkuhaan ng ibang income. So yun po yung ginawa namin. Talagang uh, before na-involve siya talagang yung DNR at through GIC and local government unit ay talagang nag-abang-abag para matrain sila how to accommodate tourists. Talagang yun yung pinamulat sa kanila na kailangan dito tayo mag-focus. Mag-focus tayo sa ecotourism na kahit nag-focus tayo na dito tayo kikita, still uh, hindi natin masisira yung uh, ecosystem na doon sa loob ng Timar. Kaya po, doon ginawa po namin muna yung management zone before kami um, open for tourism purposes. Kasi po kapag walang plano yung isang area, talaga mawawasak talaga. Lalo na po walang carrying capacity yung isang area. Talagang yung influx ng visitor, hindi mo makakontrol. 
yung amin ginawa mo na lahat namin na lahat na plano from uh, management zone gumawa kami ng carrying capacity then you know pen ano lang ba yung area na talagang pwedeng pasukin ng mga turista kasi kapag pinabayaan mo lahat yan talagang sigurado wala wala po masisira talaga yung isang uh, lugar na open for tourism siguro po kung sa encouragement lang siguro um Tignan po talaga, ano po talaga yung needs ng isang area or talaga pang for tourism purposes talaga po yan o baka hindi pa po maka ano yung mga tao, baka hindi sila sa tourism po, kumikita pa sila, talaga malaki yung kida sa pangingisda so depende lang po yun, depende po talaga sa sitwasyon ng isang area before po um, uh, magbagay or maglagay ng isang strategy para address ang isang issue Thank you so much, Sir Diana. Because um, during one of our talks with the City Tourism Office, they were considering to have a study on community-based tourism in Sipaway since they wanted to establish that one in the island, knowing that most of the tourism businesses there are not actually owned by the locals. So they wanted to, siguro, they wanted to empower the locals as well, and they wanted to establish that kind of tourism, community-based tourism po. Sige po, una po siguro muna yung gawin ng LGU. They have to check po. Kapag hindi po legal yung mga nag-operate doon sa loob, may power naman po sila. They have the authority na syempre pwede silang stop doon sa pag-operate or hindi na pwede stop, bigyan na lang ng permit. Depende kung ano yung gagawin ng local government unit. Para na lang, um, kung mas maganda kapag ano, mag-apply uh, mag na lang sila. Di ba? Yung mga, wala namang pinural instrument yung mga isla as part of the unclassified forest or unclassified island islets no, based sa mga guidelines dito sa DNR. So pwede po, um, mag-apply sila doon, uh, yung mga private entities po doon na nag-operate sa loob, pwede po silang mag-apply to legalize their operation doon sa loob. Then, um, mm -hmm. po, okay. declare ng isang uh, local government unit, like in Cebu. Uh, Dineclare po nila ang isang MPA, locally declared, uh, for tourism purposes, or regulated yung lahat ng mga activities doon sa loob. Thank you so much, Sir Diana. Thank you. Thank you, Ma'am, uh, Miss Saibel, and thank you, Sir Diana, for that very profound answer to Miss Saibel's question. So the next question that I have here is coming from our student participant from Kapsu, Kapi State University, a BSHR and four student, and his name is Louis J. Burata. His question, Sir, is... Uh, in the past, sir, what problems did you face and how did you overcome them, especially those that have a big effect on the industry of tourism, except during the pandemic? Okay. Isa po talaga na problema ng Team Marnon, what I mentioned kanina, is a base photo sa mga studies na gandawa talaga sa loob ng protected area ay yung poor governance. Kasi po, sa history ng Team Mar, uh, mula po nung pagka-establish niya as protected area, para kung hindi po siya dumaan sa tamang proseso. Based po yun sa uh, mga sinasabi ng tao, lang, uh, community consultation, parang na shortcut lang, na-establish uh, na or na-declare lang agad-agad. So yung ginawa namin, talagang bumalik kami sa unang proseso. May sampung proseso when you declaring a protected area. So bumalik kami sa una. We have to go down ulit sa mga community doon, workshop, meetings, talagang kinuha namin yung kanilang loob to accept na talagang protected area na ang lugar nila. Kasi po kapag hindi na-accept ng community yung isang protected area, sila din po yung magiging pasaway sa loob. Kapag na-accept na din po nila, kapag mo po yung loob nila by uh, finding champions, kailangan po kuhanap ka na yung isang champion mula sa local government unit, national government unit, na talagang sila yung Uh, makikipag-usap doon sa committee para makuha ang loob. Kapag nakuha na po, sila po yung tutulong sa iyo sa pag-protection at sa pag-manage ng protected area. Now, sa pandemic naman po, yung isang problema talaga, talagang bumaba yung um, tourist arrival namin. Kapag bumaba yung tourist arrival, maapektuhan po yung income ng PA na siya pong ginagamit namin sa operation. So, within two years, talagang walang income yung PA. 
So may ipo pa talagang mababang mababa. So yung ginagawa um, kasi po uh, funded naman ng Len are isang NIPAS area, yung yung protected area under NIPAS. Kaya yun po namin, yung po muna yung ginagamit talaga kasi regular uh, target naman yun, regular budget. So yun yung ginagamit, hindi namin ginalaw yung income na maliit. So inipon na muna ng inipon, then sa so ngayon, uh, doon po may nag request. So nung magka-pandemic, hindi lang po yung PA ng PEC-1, pati din po yung mga communities na talagang nagdedepende doon for tourism purposes. So yun po. Kuan lang muna, uh, parang wala, talagang walang wala yung mga tao box sa pangisda. Pero yung ginawa, hindi po sila nangisda doon sa loob ng PA, kundi po sa labas ng boundary ng Tinmar. Yan po. Okay, thank you so much, Sir Rhett, for, the, uh, for that profound answer. I think uh, Mr. Louis is very satisfied with your answer. So next question, I'll be calling in. Ma'am Myra Paradero, uh, our uh, student in DMBA 400. Ms. Myra? Hello, sir. Good afternoon. Hi, ma'am. <clears throat> yes, sir. I'm just curious, no? Because uh, under the doctorate program, which is uh, having, uh, which some of the universities is having right now, which is uh, major in ecotourism, right? No, I, I hope uh, you do heard about this program. Uh, sa doctorate nila bala sir uh, so i'm just curious if what is the counterpart of your ecosystem management under your program so ano siya anong counterpart niyo sir with this program especially sa mga doctorate ni bala sa mga universities which is major in ecotourism okay sa ngayon po parang sa tingin ko wala pa po kaming counterpart Kasi po parang this is the first time na <laughs> parang nag, uh, nag-join kami for this activity. So ngayon po, isa lang po yung sa mga, isa din po siguro sa counterpart, siguro mga sabi natin counterpart, marami pong mga students from um, different universities na nag-study ngayon for the ecotourism ng Tinmar. Kaya lang po, sa ngayon wala pa po kaming mga, um, mga reports, parang wala pa pong natapos sa mga studies. Kasi po minsan, uh, napakira po uh, pumasok sa isang PA in terms of research kasi you need, kailangan mong uh, makuha yung approval ng management board before the research will be conducted within the area. So I think po, parang ganito lang po yung mga counterpart kasi mostly po kami sa Tinmar, lahat po ng mga counterparts within the universities, uh, ecosystem based talaga. Hindi po, po kami for ecotourism <laughs> ng mga lectures or what na mga... Ano doon sa ibang universities? But uh, follow up question, sir. Is it may ano ba? Dapat, uh, if you're going to be asked, dapat ba may ara, maka, ano man sila sa, makarelate man sila din sa ano? Kasi after na tapos nila yung doctorate nila, which is a major in ecotourism, so dapat may ano din sila? Dapat may share or something may, himu, may himuun sila ba lang, sir? Which is related to that, uh, ano? So, um, Okay, do ano mama? Ang, 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 ang student parang may counterpart sa ecotourism or within us nga, amon nga counterpart. Oh, pero wala, wala pa siya do tie up something, sir. Do amon na siya. So wala pa kami gid ma'am tie up within the ah, okay. Within the university lang, ma'am. Uh, within the uh, university. Except lang siguro, ma'am, for the University of the Visayas, for the Philippines, Visayas. Kasi doon talaga sila sa Tinmar nagbe-base. Ayan. So, yeah. so that is, I think that is the answer to my question. Uh, <laughs> So there were some universities. In terms of ecotourism, um, parang hindi pa po, parang wala pa. Ah, okay. Talaga, oo, kasi mm -hmm. mostly Philippine science yung pumapasok sa amin. Kahit ah, okay. na yung sa GSU, wala pa po, ano mga researchers na pumapasok doon. Sana kung pwede, ina-encourage okay. talaga namin na pumapasok ah, doon gawin sa loob ng okay. Timar. Para Sige, naman sir. yung result. magagamit din namin sa aming management. Uh -huh. Ito yes, talaga sir. yung kailangan namin ngayon. Uh -huh. Dapat, no? Kasi dapat okay. meron ding ano, uh, parang research na okay. makakakandap. Okay. Sige, sir. So, thank you. <laughs> thank yes, you so much sa inyo nga. Ano, sir, yun, ano, parang like curious lang. <laughs> thank you po. Salamat. Okay. Thank you so much, Ma'am Myra and Sir Rep for that very good uh, Q&A. Okay, so next question, I'll be uh, reading from the Zoom chat box. This question comes from our student attendee, 
and her he, she is from Altavas College, a BSHM4 student, and her name is Abigail B. De Pedro. Her question, sir, is how do protected areas benefit humans? Okay, so una po pinakita ko na yung spillover. Una po yung spillover. If we have to protect the area, lalo na po uh, isda or habitat ecosystem. Di ba yung unang mabibunipet sa lagang ng tao yung spillover. Makakuha sila ng malalaking isda kasi we preserve ng area for the, their breeding, uh, for breeding purposes. Breeding and feeding purposes. Kaya unang benefits doon ay yung mapukuha ng isda na lumalabas sa PA. So masusure, may insure talaga based sa study ng pinakita ko doon sa um, touch point effort yung income ng tao. No, doon na nang galing yung isda sa PA. Number two, mapapreserve natin yung area. So hindi lang naman sa physical na income. So we have to go for uh, sempre sa mga natural resources kasi ang dami nilang services. Example, we have uh, una lang yung yung pangisda. Ikadoro services, they have to benefits kapag may mga malalaking uh, kapag may typhoon, storm surge, we have the mangrove na po-protect sa ating coastal communities. Number two, they have to regulate yung pan, um, carbon emission. So we have ang yung sigas at, at saka mangrove na pakalaking carbon storage. Ito ba talagang laking tulong na sa climate change? Then, um, we have also the culture, cultural services. Diba? Pwede po siyang for tourism, scientific, and research purposes. Yun po yung mabab uh, uh, parang mababenefits ng mga communities yun sa pag-declare ng isang lugar for protected area. Sabi po for future generation na po yun. Okay, so thank you so much, sir, for that uh, wonderful answer. Uh, next, I'll be calling Sir Jeff de Sukatan. Sir Jeff? Good afternoon, Sir Red. Hi, good afternoon. <laughs> so, nice sir. to see you po. Uh, though I can see your face. You're, are you off come, sir? Yes, you know, I'm in the middle of the middle. Okay, hello, sir. Nice hello. to meet you virtually anyway actually this is kind of related to the question you answered earlier but i just like to specify if what are your future plans to taklong island since actually i've been there last 2017 and they really love the island it's really a virgin island to be specific i will to describe it yes it's for you uh it's up for some of future plans is to be legislated talagang ma-recognize na po ng Congress. Ma-inact kami ng Congress. Isa po yung, uh, em yung importansya po kasi doon na ma-legislate ka or talagang full pledge protected area ka ay may sarili ka ng budget, may sarili kang personnel. Na iyan po talaga yung kailangan ng TINMAR para ma-manage ng wasto. At saka po, ang dami pong mga-benefits kapag na-legislate talaga po mabibigyan namin ng trabaho yung locals kasi po sa personnel kailangan po sa personnel um ano yung proposed na personnel element 30% of that manggagaling po sa community so isa po yun na ma, isa po yung malaking tulong doon sa dalawang barangay na naapektuhan during the establishment ng mar doon po sa Thank you so much, Sir Red. Sir Jet, do you still have follow-up question? Done, ma'am. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, so we'll move on to the next question, which I will be reading from our Zoom chat box. And this question, sir, is coming from our student attendee from Altavas College, and his name is Rodel. Hervasio. His question for you, sir, is how do protected areas help to balance the environment? Jifa, thank you, sir, for the question. Sa pag-protect pa lang natin ng ecosystem, talagang binabalansin na po natin yung ating environment. Kasi po, kapag wala po tayong mga coastal and marine ecosystem doon sa loob, sir, wala na din po, wala na din po yung uh, mawala po yung uh, productivity uh, yung productivity at saka services ng isang or ng bawat ecosystem 
yung productivity po yung para po yung um di ba yung perfect levels natin di ba they have from man group yung binibigay nila at uh, detritus to feed yung mga isda at saka yung isda pupunta naman sa isang ecosystem kain ng isda from perfect level uh, from lower to uh, higher uh, level then doon naman po sa services kapag wala na din po sila hindi po na, hindi na po nila yung community kami pong way di ba like what i say kanina from typhoons storm swords they are breakers they serve as physical barriers doon po sa mga um, masasamang panahon na nangyari sa ngayon both by the climate change pang yun po yun po talaga yung um, benefits at talagang yun po yung kailangan para ma-balance natin yung ating uh, ecosystem at saka uh, communities at environment Okay, so thank you so much again, Sir Rhett, for that very enlightening answer. Okay, I think uh, Mr. Hervasio is very satisfied of your answer. Okay, so next question, sir, I'll be reading again from the Zoom chat box, and it is coming from Ms. Azel Arsenas. Okay, so her question, sir, is what else do you think needs to be improved or paid attention to in the Taklong Island? And how will you make this improvement? Okay, po. So, kailangan pa din po natin i-improve yung involvement ng community kasi po hindi naman lahat makukuha natin, di ba? Talagang may, uh, may tao talagang kahit anong encouragement na gagawin mo, talagang kontang kontra So, we need to improve still our IEC program. Communication skills, Pababab din na baba sa community para makuha natin talaga lahat ng tao na talagang uh, i-accept nila yung protected area at saka ma-involve sila sa lahat ng mga activities na um, ginagawa doon sa loob. By doing that, eh, siguro kapag ganyan, makikita sa ngayon na lahat satisfied dahil may protected area, masasabi nating uh, siguro na successful talaga yung management ng Tinmar. So we need talaga yun ng community. Kunin natin ang community para lang uh, ma-manage natin ng wasto yung isang PA. Okay. So, thank you, Sir Rhett, for that uh, answer. Maybe Miss uh, uh, Azel is very, um, uh, is very, it, it suffices her, her, her understanding of uh, your answer. Okay. So, again, we'll have um, a question coming from Jet B. Clark. Sir Jet, are you ready? Yes, ma'am. Hi, sir. Uh, uh, sir, good afternoon. La, sir, may audible, sir. Ah, oh, sir, but uh, okay, okay. Okay, yes, sir. Yes, so, sir. my question is, is this a status of an area being a protected area perpetual or will it reach a time na hindi na siya i-consider na protected ng government or what are what will be the factors if it will happen Okay po, ganito po. Ay yung isang protected area, kapag na-declare po siya na PA, uh, na-declare siya po ito, <coughs> or other local government unit, locally declared, um, automatic po magiging um, yung protection, yung, yung, yung area is enforceable by law na dahil may mga municipal ordinance or guidelines, law, na nag-govern sa isang area. Now, pwede din pong i-de-establish ang isang protected area kapag hindi po maganda yung labas ng management. For example, protected area po, sige pa din, wasak pa din yung mga habitat natin. Yung community, hindi pa din uh, nag accept na protected area. That is the ground or basis po na pwede po siyang de-establish ng kung sino man yung nag-declare. Yun po, sir. Okay. Sige, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you, sir. Sagot po. Okay, so thank you, Sir Jet Viclar, for that question and also Sir Red for that enlightening answer. Okay, so the next question 
uh, will be coming again from our student attendee, which is from, again, Altavas College. And his name is Louis Jim O. Rosales. Okay, sir, this is his question. Why it is so important to preserve and connect protected areas? Okay, so... Ah, uh, kanina po sinabi ko talaga ang importante talaga na i-preserve ang isang area. By doing or by being uh, by establishing a protected area or marine protected area kasi we have to protect talaga po. Sa ngayon po, nakikita na nakikita natin sa mga data, sa mga studies, talagang bumababa po yung fish catch. Yung online po natin bumababa, mas lalong dumadami yung trash fishes. If you know po yung trash fish, yung maliliit na isda na kukuha natin doon sa lagat. So, isa pong um, objectives, biodiversity conservation objectives para po ma-protectionan ma natin yung ating mga ecosystem. Hindi lamang po sa atin yung, kundi po pati na po for the future generation ay kailangan nating mag-declare talaga ng mga PAs. So, dyan po, uh, para maka-establish tayo, parang bangko po yan, parang bangko ng mga isda. We have to, nakilala natin, i- bigyan ang mga isda ng pagkakataon na makapag-breed. Makapagdami. Kasi sa ngayon po, halos kulang na kulang na yung mga breeders natin uh, based po sa mga studies. So kung hindi pa tayo declare ng isang PA at pabayaan lang natin na kunin na kunin lang po yun ng ating mga isda, talagang mawalan tayo isda in the future. So that's why na kailangan mayroon silang masisilungan yung mga isda. Breeding ground, feeding ground, nursery ground. So yun po yung main aspect ng isang marine protected area. Pag sinabi naman itong PA, terrestrial, iba naman po yan. May uh, pinag-protectionan tayong mga threatened species. Yung mga species na unti-unti nang nalawala, unti-unti nang extinct or nagiging status, critical na endangered, kailangan pa din po. Para hindi sila mawala, you have to declare PA. Then hindi lang po yun, ang dami po siyang mga services. So I say kanina, yung hindi lang po sa production purposes yung protection, kundi po doon sa services ng bawat ecosystem na ibinigay po sa atin or ibinigay po sa mga tao. Yun. Okay, so thank you so much again, Sir Rep, for that very illuminating uh, answer. And I agree with you, Sir, uh, that we need to preserve our marine areas for the, for the enjoyment also for the of the future generation. So, kung may ara kita nga gina-enjoy subong, we should take care of it so that the future generations will be able to enjoy it also. Okay, so uh, another question, sir. I will be reading. Uh, this is from our classmate, Mr. Michael Bellarmino. And this is his question. How do you help society from the effects of climate change and maintain the critical ecosystem services on which all societies depend? Thank you. Uh, by protecting Tinmar, uh, dito po, minibitigate na natin yung climate change. Isa na po tayo sa tutulong sa pagmitigate ng climate change, yung ecosystem na bawat natin protection na. Example, mangrove forest. So, sinasabi ng mangrove forest, yung pinaka-main na services niya, regulatory, carbon sequestration. So, siya yung nagsisikester ng, ng mga atmospheric carbon. And it is higher yung kanyang sequestration compared to terrestrial forest, four to five times higher. So, that is isa na po yun sa mga um, reason na talagang tumutulong tayo sa mag-mitigate ng climate change. Kaya it's talagang napaka-importante sa ngayon sa atin na we have to protect our mangrove igas area and other system. Dahil connected naman po lahat ng yun. Kapag nawala yung isang ecosystem, sigurado po mawawala din po yung, kas ay yung katabi niyang ecosystem. Kaya doon sa Tinmar, may apat na ecosystem. We have the terrestrial ecosystem. We have the mangrove. We have the seagrass and coral reef ecosystem. Kaya para pong perfect na perfect for the protected area kasi po yung connectivity ng bawat ecosystem nandiyan 
hindi pa po natin ikat kasi may uh, hindi pa po na, na may mention na talagang we have the planktonic zone kung saan po doon po nanginginain yung mga juvenile fishes natin so pang perfect na perfect hindi lang po sa pagiging protected area kundi po sa pagmitigate ng climate change although po hindi po natin may iwasan talagang affected din kami ng, ng climate change like the typhoon o death so isa na po yun sa epekto ng isa na po yun sa mga ano ng climate change so may mga damage din po kaming mangrove doon sa loob marami po kaming naputol na mangrove without those mangroves sigurado po yung mapepektuhan yung community doon sa likod ng mangrove forest so yun po yung isang mga benefits doon ng mga tao thank you po okay so thank you so much sir Red again uh Indeed, we have really to protect our ecosystem. We have to take care of it because this will help us from all calamities that we will uh, be experiencing. Okay, so again, uh, may I call on uh, Mr. Michael, Sir Michael Bilarmino for his question. Sir Mike? Yes, well, I'm here. So Hi, thank sir. you. Hi, sir. Good afternoon. So, another question lang po, sir. So, my question is, what are some environmental and social challenges or issues that you have encountered and what are your common solutions you may suggest to handle it, uh, to handle these challenges and issues? Okay. So, puta po muna natin sa environmental. So, isa po yung problema namin is sea level rise. Uh, we have the sea level rise uh, as um, uh, gawa po ng ating climate change. So yung unang mapetuhan po sa sea level rise yung mangrove. Now, the problem is, wala nang, kasi yung mangrove habang tumataas yung tubig, nabigrate yan sa landward. Eh. Pupunta yun sa landward. So ngayon, yung topography na mar, ay parang cliff. Ang dami kaming island na cliff. Hindi na makakaakyat yung uh, mangrove doon para tumubo. So we have to look ano pa talaga yung pwede mo. Sa ngayon po, uh, kahit sakit po ngayon, sige po po yung study. So, um, titignan pa namin based sa biodiversity monitoring system ano talaga yung uh, ano talaga yung epekto ng sea level rise doon sa mangrove pwede bang mawala yung mangroves namin or pwede ba siyang may migrate to landward within the mainland na part kasi po kung sa mga isla talagang wala eh. sigurado maapektuhan talaga yung mangrove may possibility na baka mawala in the future kapag hindi talaga kapag naging abrupt na talaga yung pagtaas ng big so pwede din siyang makabawi doon naman sa mainland so yun isang tinitignan. So kailangan, kailangan doon sa plano pa lang sa mainland, wala ng development. Wala ng development, wala ng structure. Open na po open na po lahat yan. Para in case na ganyan yung mangyari sa isla, doon makabawi kami doon sa mainland. Another for the social. Yung sabi ko po kanina, yung for acceptance ng tao. So yung ginawa namin, talagang bumalik kami sa community. Bumaba ulit sa community, nakipag-usap sa community, naging communicate. Talagang grabe yung ginawa doon para lang ma-approve ang lahat ng mga plano. No? Para at least doon na buwaba ka sa kanila. Talagang ginawa mo yung tatlong pillar ng governance. Yung, um, um, yung participatory, transparency, and accountability. Kapag accept pa silang tao yung protected area, lahat kayo accountable. Hindi lang po sa isang tao. Lahat kayo accountable sa isang plano or sa isang activity or isang project na ginawa doon sa loob. So, lahat kayo nagka-approve. Yun po. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, so thank you so much, Sir Michael, for that question and for Sir Rep for enthusiastically answering your question. Okay, so uh, maybe um, we can call another participant to ask for question. Anybody from the participant? Can I call on Sister Marley? Hi, uh, Mr. Diana. Good afternoon. Hello, ma'am. Um, actually, my questions had been also answered, but I just want to ask this one. But first of all, thank you very much for, for giving us information about uh, 
uh, Taklong Island case. Actually, um, I don't know about this. No, this is my first time to hear this. But because of your talk and also the the answer to the questions, I gain a lot of information about it. I am just uh, curious about uh, you know with the growing pressure, a uh, growing pressure in our. Uh, uh, present situation like uh, population growth or the growing demand for food and, and the climate change that had been mentioned already. Now, can the Philippines uh, sustain its marine reserves, sir? I think, ma'am, sa ngayon po, sa ngayon na status, um, uh, we have at least 244 areas in the Philippines under National Integrated Protected Area System Act. Hindi pa po, uh, parang wala pa po akong idea kung ilan lahat yung locally declared MPAs kasi mas madami po yun i ah. sa mga NIPAS. Then, yung marine areas po natin na PA is only 68 out of 244. So, sa ganitong present status po, kung sa growing, kung iyan na po hindi tayo mag ng mga MPAs, hindi po niya masusustain. Kasi po yung po yung lumabas talaga sa mga study, kulang na kulang pa po yung mga MPAs natin. Hindi po kanyang isustain yung kailangan ng ating bansa or ng population in terms na po ng isda. Kasi di ba sa isda, dyan tayo kumukuha ng protein, halos 80% ng protein dyan ah. ngayon sa isda. So hindi po masusustain. Sa kaya ngayon po, yung target within the IG, yung IG target natin, we have to go for the 30-30. 30% of our um, Philippine waters or we say municipal waters lang, isang municipio, 30% of that, kailan po i-declare na PA or MPA para po to sustain yun po yung kailangan or yung fishery production na lang po ng ating um, mga PA with dagat kasi po dami naman sa mga inland. Eh. <coughs> Kaya lang, mostly yung isda po talagang sa dagat nagagaling yung uh, talagang kinukonsume po natin, hindi po from the inland. So yun po, yun, yun, yun po ngayon yung main na target ng hindi po yung Pilipinas, hindi buong mundo po. 30-30. By 2030, kailangan po 30% of our marine water was declared as marine protected area to sustain yung pangangailangan po ng ating population. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sister, for your question and also, sir, Rhett, for that uh very informative answer okay so i think um we still have time for more questions okay may i call on um mom santa renea for her question good afternoon Hi, good afternoon sir Red. Hi, um sir yes um actually i i have um questions that has been brought up already but I am very curious of this one, sir, because here in our place, sir, we have our mangrove eco park, and it is being um, maintained by our LGU and Department of Tourism. Um, do you have any um, um, uh, suggestion, sir, or advice for us? Because in in our university, we we have our extension projects for our mangrove eco park. Um, regarding its sustainability of the eco park, sir, if um, what else can we do for the sustainability of our mangrove eco park? Yes, ma'am. Ah, kaya na, kaya na, as mo kung saan po yung area po? Ay, sir? Kung saan po yung eco park? Um, here in Ibahay, sir, we Ay, call it the Patungtan at Ibahay Mangrove Eco Park in Aklan. <coughs> Sige, ma'am. Okay po. Ibahay, I think po, yun na po yung pinakamagandang uh, mangrove uh, management doon po sa Aklan. Di po ba? Dahil po nandyan si Ma'am Primavera, yung idol ko po, Ma'am Georgine. Siya po talaga yes, yung, oh, siya po talaga yun. Siya din po yung mga mentor namin sa uh, mga training sa mangrove. I think po, isa lang po yun yung ang siguro sa sustainability ng, kasi morally po, tourism din po yung target ng ibahay. Opo. Then, Opo. Siguro po yung ano lang dyan, 
yung boardwalk medyo ano siya po parang pagpunta namin hindi ko lang parang 2018 17 uh, parang hindi na po siya friendly sa visitor so we need na talaga na i-repair yung uh, mangrove boardwalk para po makapag-attract pa tayo ng more na tourists lalo na po ng mga researchers kasi ang dami yes, po nag-research po dyan sa mangrove Opo. in terms of Opo. management siguro po talagang grabe na po yung ibahay just because po nandyan si Ma'am Georgine. And okay. yung tamang proseso sa management, yung pagtanim doon sa mga mangrove area na kailangan i-rehab, ay talaga pong nagawa na po nandyan po sa inyo sa ato lang. Yes, sir. Okay, so thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am Santa Renea. And also, Sir Red. Sir, there is a question. It, it is actually a clarification. And this question uh, comes from uh, Miss Rosalyn Abuan. Her question, sir, is she would like to uh, clarify uh, if when you say Taklong Island, Taklong Island is a protected area, is fishing not allowed in that area? So, kanito po may pinapita po ako management zone. So, open po kami. Hindi po kami purely conservation. Kasi po, ah, di ba po kanina inter, um, harmonious interaction of human and nature. So, open po kami sa fishing. But yung fishing naman po, fishing activity is regulated. Yun lang pong traditional fishing yung iniallow sa loob ng protected area. Kapag gumamit ka po ng mga nets or other methods ng fishing, consider na po as illegal fishing doon po sa loob ng National Marine Reserve. Then my first funding fines and penalties na po yun. Yan po. Okay. So, thank you, Sir Arret, once again. Uh, um, by the way, Sir, this is just a follow-up question regarding the fines that you have mentioned. Yes, ma'am. Uh, if, for example, the people who will get into that reserve area will be get caught for um, disobeying or for not, uh, uh, did not, um, hindi sila nag, nagsunod sa, sa rule of that protected area, who sets the fine for them? Is it the DNR or the LGU? Okay. Um, doon po sa amin sa Tinmar, dalawa po yung ginagamit namin na law. Uh, yung una po yung NIPAS law. NIPAS law, uh, approved by the Congress. So, medyo malaki po yung fines doon. Pumaabot po ng millions. Kapag nahuli ka, uh, based po sa, uh, sa degree ng violation. Nagdipindi po sa degree ng violation. Kapag illegal fishing talaga, gumagamit ka ng mga destructive gear such as dynamic fishing. Um, or pwede din po yung compressor or ano pa po, basta nakabista ka ng isang habitat or isang ecosystem, napakalapino ng pina yan. Nakawit mo na yung fines, maybe po, 1 million based sa naipas. But dahil po, mostly, marginal fishers yung nangiisda sa loob ng timar. And those marginal fishers, doon din po sa dalawang barangay na yon ng mga liit na mga kasi sila din po yung apektuhan. So we have the policy from the Protected Area Management Board approve nila through uh, resolution na kailangan po ano doon po nakalagay na my first offense, second offense, and third offense. Now, depende pa din po yun sa degree regulation. Kapag nang isda ka using the gill net, using the gill net kasi consider si legal na po doon sa loob. So, yung first policy, uh, hindi ka pa po huhulihin. Uh, we have to conduct IEC na lang. So, medyo usap-usap, discussion. Then, kailangan require ka ng permit to local government unit. Kapag walang permit yung gears mo at saka mga boats mo at hindi ka, hindi ka din uh, registered na fishers. Second offense, magpa-file po kami ng case based po sa municipal ordinance. Based sa municipal fishery ordinance ng Nueva Valencia. So kapag napatunayan na nag, uh, may mga violation ka, Example, gilnet, walang registration or registration yun dahil second offense na. Ay, yung fines po, 2,500 to 3,000. Then, yung boat po, another 2,500 to 3,000 and nakacharge po yan per head kung ilan po kayo yung nangingisda. 
Okay, so may court na po. Mag-court na po yung mag-decide. Talagang nasa proseso po yan ng kaso. Then, kapag nahuli ka pa rin for the third time, then magpa-file na po kami ng NIPAS. Yun na po yung gagamitin namin. So, yung sa NIPAS naman, uh, medyo mm, talagang medyo masakit na yung yung mga penalties kasi habang tumatakbo yung case, uh, kailangan mo nang makulong. Then malaki na yung fines. Pwedeng makulong ka or at magbayad ng fines, pwedeng yung fines, makulong ka lang. Yun po. Depende po sa court. Court talaga po yung nag-decide. Is po lahat sa law yung uh, ginagamit namin na i-file doon sa violators. Yan po ma'am. Okay, so thank you so much, Sir Red, for that very uh, informative answer to our questions. Okay, so I think uh, we still have uh, time for more questions, and I'll be reading another question coming from the chat box. It is coming from our student uh, attendee, and uh, she's, she's from Altavas College. BSHRM4, and her name is Jella May Kawali. This is her question to you, Sir Red. Is there any disadvantage or is, are there any disadvantages of living in the protected areas? Uh, uh, living in the protected areas? Living within? Uh, yes, sir. Living within the protected uh, area. Kasi po, ay yung case naman sa Tumar, wala po kaming community sa loob ng protected area. So, isa po kami sa mga pinakaswerting protected area na wala kaming, wala kaming problema in terms ng community sa loob talaga ng PA. So, yung mga PAs namin ay sa labas ng boundaries. Ay, ah, yung mga community ay doon nakatira. But for the question, ganito po. Kapag isa ka po, kapag doon ka po na nakastay or isa ka po sa mga um, parang na-approve na tenured migrant yun po yung mga yung term po sa loob ng uh, sa mga committee sa loob ng isang protected area like in the case ng Negros Iloilo ang dami po nating mga communities na naka-reside sa loob ng PA so binibigyan po sila ng uh, parang special permit or special tenorial instrument so Parma, from Protected Areas Community Based Resource Management Agreement. Yun po yun. Parang yun na po yung parang title. Uh, parang title na po, na parang sa lupa. But yan po yan ay uh, still um, renewable within 25 years. So medyo uh, kapag doon ka sa isang PA, talagang nakalimit yung mga activities na, na kailangan mong gawin. If you have to develop example, you have the capital naman para mag-develop kaya mostly naman sa mga PA natin ecotourism basta up po sa Pambi then nasa loob ka ng multiple zone then nakasub zone for recreational activities so, kung po yung magpa-fund ng isang project dyan kailangan mo po dumaan sa mabusising proseso so hindi po pwedeng makapagtayo ng kung ano-ano dyan sa loob kahit po mag-harvest ka lang ng products mo example ka ako itumanin pa sa loob nagtanim ka dahil yung area mo approved for multiple uses sabi ko din approved for production forest yung isang area still hindi mo po pwedeng maharvest yung kahoy na yan kapag wala ka pong approval doon sa management board para pong kapag doon ka sa loob ng isang PA talagang napaka-limited po ng bawat activities or development na magawa mo po sa loob ng PA yun po Okay so thank you so much again sir rep for that uh, very uh, informative answer to the question of Miss Jelame. Okay, so I think Miss Jelame is sat is very satisfied with your answer. Okay, so do we still have time for more question, or are you tired of uh, answering the question, sir? Or you still have okay, the so energy <laughs> to go on with it? Okay, so for now, I think we still have last question okay so this uh, last question i think it will be coming from uh sir noli diaz sir noli hi sir sir noli are you around
Sir Nolly. Okay, so I will just be reading a question, sir, from... Oh, I'm sorry, Sir Rhett, but I think there is no more time for <laughs> a more question and answer because we still have another speaker yes, no. to uh, for his talk. So I think it is time for us to return the floor to our host. And thank you very much, Sir Rhett, for your um, yes, time no. and for your uh, kindness to be with us this afternoon. Okay, so since we are done with the Q&A portion, I would like to turn over the floor to our host, Ms. Joanna Grace. Mom Joanna, back to you. Thank you very much, Mom Maynen Lubugin, for being the moderator for Open Forum. Sir Rath, we are very pleasured and honored that you were able to um, grant our request and sharing your experiences and knowledge in the um, topic about protected area management in Taklong Island case. Thank you very much, sir. Madamo, na salama. Well, at this point of time, may I call on our technical arrangement chairperson, Nolly B. Diaz Jr., for awarding of e-certificate of appreciation. Good afternoon. Am I audible? Yes. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, at this juncture, I would like to award this certificate. Reads, Republic of the Philippines State University and Colleges, Guimaras State University Graduate School Program, McLean Benavista, Guimaras. Certificate of Appreciation is given to Mr. Reth Arthur Diana for the gift of time and expertise as a resource speaker during the DMBA 402 webinar on environmental management with the theme of protected area management the Taklong Island case held on August 21st 2022 via zoom presented and given this 21st day of August 2022 signed by Mr. Jet Disokatan webinar chairperson also Gabby P. Palacios our webinar co-chairperson together with Dr. Annaline Hanaban, DMBA program head, and early Dr. Hurley M. Martir, Dean of Graduate School. And lastly, we have our advisor, Dr. Gina Bimontes, the DBM, uh, DBMA 402 professor. Thank you very much, Sir Nolly. Sir Rep, thank, thank, you, thank you, thank you very much. Well, at this point of time, may I call on our technical arrangement chairperson, Mr. Anthony Y. Española, MS HM, for our group photo opportunity and e-evaluation. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Wow. Such an inspiration um, to hear the topic about uh, environment, which is really missing nowadays, no? especially for, for today's generation. So thank you for leaving it up again, Sir Rhett. So at sure. this juncture, I would like to request all the students participants, organizers, and speakers, and to our advisors to please turn on your camera. But before that, I have posted the e-evaluation form.
on our chat organizers, our advisor and speaker to please turn on your camera for our photo opportunity. Perfect. May call on some students, please. Wow, those genuine smiles. All right, let's start. Okay, on, the, on to the first panel. One, two, three, five. Okay, next panel. One, two, three. Perfect. Next panel, please. Okay. Those abundant smile. One, two, three. Okay. Let's move on to our last panel. One, two, three. Perfect. Okay. May I request all the students to please turn off their cameras to keep way for the photo opportunity of the organizer, speaker, and advisor. All right. Okay, perfect. In three, two, one, smile. Okay. Thank you very much for actually participating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Anthony. <clears throat> So, I would like to check if our participants are still um, awake on our third speaker. May I request our dear participants to click a heart button on a reaction on your Zoom? Can I? If you are still awake, guys. A heart button. And a for our dear speaker. Wow, a lots of hearts coming from our participants. Thank you very much, Sir Diana. Thank you for your valuable time. Well, without further ado, let us continue on our third and last speaker. May I call on our documentation and compilation chairperson? Ms. Saibel on A. Ramirez and MBA for the introduction of third speaker. Thank you so much, uh, Doki Johanna. So our speaker for today completed his electronics and communications engineering at De La Salle, Manila and completed his master's in business administration marketing at the same university. He started his career in the IT industry being a software engineer for Fitsu 10 Software and Accenture. Having an entrepreneur mindset, Ed started exquisite photography in Tagbilaran, Bohol, specializing in portrait and wedding photography. After seven years in the wedding industry, Ed settled in Iloilo to help his father set up Ephratha Farms, a premier farm tourism destination in Western Visayas. As the general manager of Ephratha Farms, Ed is greatly involved in the general operations and the test the farm school that he manages at Ephratha. Ed was recognized as one of the top 10 wedding photographers in the Philippines in the year 2013 to 2015 by the Wedding and Portrait Photographers of the Philippines. He is also the 2018 Department of Agriculture's Regional Gawad Saka Awardee. Participants, let's all give a virtual applause and help us welcome Engineer Ed Roderick Canuto. Thank you very much for, for that kind introduction. Let me share my, my slides. All right. Good afternoon once again, and uh, I would like to thank you for the opportunity for, for choosing me as one of your speakers for your topic uh, for today. Uh, initially, I was uh, asked to, to discuss about environmental topic, and I initially declined because 
I think this is not my cup of tea. But then again, uh, it dawned on me that well, what, what we are doing actually in our farm activities are, are environmentally friendly farming practices. And that's what I want to share with you this afternoon. And uh, Effort of Farm started in 2013 here in Iloilo. And uh, as a farmer, no, there are so many things that uh, you want to do. No? They say, okay, you plant because this helps the environment. You plant trees because this will uh, clean the air. Okay? And then when we, when we are doing our planting activities, then we realize that uh, it's easy to plant, but it's uh, really very difficult to maintain because there are so many things that, uh, uh, should I say, como contra sa ginagawa mo. No? In farming, there are so many things that you have to consider. It's not just the, what variety you'll plant, what vegetables, what trees, or what fruiting trees will you plant. Uh, you should also consider so many things. Number one, you should consider the environment. Is the, is the, is the plant you are planting in your area suited for your environment? It's like, okay, I want to plant strawberries, but uh, strawberries require very cold temperature. So it's very difficult, uh, near to impossible to plant strawberries in lowland areas. So that's why you have to consider so many things. And aside from that, even though you consider these things that, ah, yes, this, this type of variety of plant is suited for my, for my topography, for my type of land. And then uh, you started planting. And then here comes mga kontrabida sa buhay ng isang farmer. Let me introduce to you the contrabidas ng isang farmer. I have five friends here. Number one, we call the pest. Fungus, the diseases, of course, the lack of nutrition. That's uh, basically uh, lack of nutrients in the soil and also the weeds. Okay. Uh, why pest? Of course, number one, pests devour what we plant. Okay. Also consider this: no, not all insects are pests. In fact, uh, only thirty to forty percent of the insects are pests. Meaning, sila yung kumokontra or kumakae ng tinatani mo. There are some insects that are what we call beneficial insects. When we say beneficial insects, they are the one who eats the bad insects or the pests. So, uh, as a farmer. The simplest solution uh, to, to kill the pest is to spray pesticides. And when you spray pesticides, of course, this has a very significant thing uh, that contributes negatively to our environment. Why? Because number one, it's not natural. And it's, and it's a synthetic, it comes from a synthetic chemical. Going back 100 years ago, Wala namang pesticides. How come the farmers in the olden days, in the Bible, during the time of the Bible, doesn't spray pesticides? How come they can produce? How come they can produce good crops? But now it seems like the farmers are trained to to make this a solution that whenever they encounter pests, the easiest thing to do is to spray insecticides. Now, little did they know that uh, companies market it this way so they, can, they could earn income from, from what they are selling. Uh, but the negative effect of pesticides is this. Number one, pesticides can drift outside of the area where it was sprayed. It can leach through the soil. It can be carried as runoff or it may be spilled accidentally. So when I say Pesticides can drift outside of your area. Even if say, oh, this is my farm. I will spray here. I don't care. Uh, it's none of your business if, you, if I spray pesticides. But little that the farmer know that <coughs> just one, one wind, gush of wind, can carry the pesticides to the other farm, thus uh, infecting the other farms. We have this problem before that we were planting hundreds of papaya in our farm then suddenly our and 
and suddenly our papayas uh, doesn't look good anymore and it, it's like uh, they will they will be dying why uh, what happened because our neighbor sprayed uh, herbicides on his rice field so just a gush of wind carried this pesticides or this uh, herbicides to our papaya trees and eventually our papaya tree died so it's a waste of uh, opportunity and a waste of uh, inputs and as i said it can leach through the soil as you can see uh, when we spray the spray doesn't 100% uh, goes to the plant sometimes it it drops to the soil and when it drops to the soil, the problem there is it can leach going down to the soil. The problem is what if the pesticides reach the water table of your, of your area? So that means uh, the water you are drawing from the well can be poisoned or has a pesticide residue. So probably in small quantities, you didn't realize that you are already ingesting that in your body and then time would tell that, uh, that every time you drink water you actually drink pesticides and it will accumulate in your body and then uh, uh, there you have a health problem okay so another one is the use of pesticides can decrease the general biodiversity in the soil uh, when i uh, the, the reason for this is uh, when you spray pesticides and it reach, leaches through the soil, uh, the microorganisms and or, or the, the good insects or the insects that lives under the soil that doesn't really uh, harm your plant can also be killed. So that kills or stops the, the biodiversity of uh, the soil. So that's, that becomes unnatural already. Third, Application of pesticides to crops that are in bloom can kill honeybees, which acts as pollinators. They also decrease crop pollination and reproduction. You know, these are the type of insects that are what we call good insects. Imagine a world without honeybees. There will be no flowers. There will be no pollination. If there will be no pollination, there will be no fruits. There will be no vegetables, uh, fruiting crops like eggplant, tomato, because these plants require pollination, the transferring of the pollen to another flower, and uh, that makes the fruit. So without this uh, honeybees or insects that helps in pollination, uh, we will have a problem with our food. And uh, as, if you spray pesticides, it doesn't choose okay, the pesticides will only kill the good insects. No, it kills all insects, good or bad. That's the bad thing about pesticides. Another thing is animals may be poisoned also by pesticides. Residue that remain on food after spraying, meaning when an animal also ingests these pesticides, and we didn't realize that we are eating animals infected by uh, induced pesticides. We are also transferring the pesticides to our body. That's why we have fish kills in, in lakes. Every time a, a company dumps their waste on the water, what body of water, you see the fish floats because the fish are killed or are poisoned. So these are some examples of uh, effects of insecticides to the environment. Also, as I told you earlier, beneficial insects are also killed together with pests. Pesticides doesn't choose whether they are killing good or bad insects. They just kill. So that's one problem, the pests. Another problem, Contrabida of a farmer is the fungus and the disease. As you can see here, the fungus is usually triggered during high humidity or when it's raining um, two to three or when there's a high moisture content in the air, fungus are usually active. And uh, this, is, this usually causes diseases. So for example, the fungus can damage, like as you've seen, it damaged the leaves. For, for us, one of our cash crops are the lettuce. 
when you sell the lettuce, you actually sell the leaves. So you cannot sell the lettuce if it's covered with fungus or there are some dark spots. Some clients doesn't want those type of uh, leafy vegetables that are matamaan uh, ng fungus. And also, during the initial stage of planting of the farmer, we have this what we call the damping off. The damping off is actually when you plant the seeds, it starts to germinate. And then after a week, the seeds, the seedlings die. Uh, we call it damping off. Parang you, will, you, will, you will be surprised that after a week or so, the seedlings from a healthy one suddenly dies. This is caused by fungus infection. The, the problem here is you cannot see this fungus. They are microscop microscopic entities. It's very difficult to, to, to kill them. So for, for, for the farmer to have an easier job, what will, what will he do? Spray fungicide. Okay, for pests, you spray pesticides. For fungus, you spray fungicides. So that's the easiest thing to do. But again, fungicide spraying also has an effect to the environment. What are these? It has a similar effect like the pesticides. Okay, So one of the effects is fungus can enter the aquatic ecosystem for by different points like discharge from wastewater treatment plants following domestic and agricultural use. Usually the, the, the waste coming from agriculture are, are like this. No? For example, I'm a farmer and I sprayed fungicide. And what will I do with my sprayer? I clean it with water. And then when I clean it with water, I dump it somewhere else to the soil. So that's a, uh, that's a practical example of uh, how these uh, fungicides can be transferred to our environment. Uh, you see that just, just by even uh, that small step that the farmer did by just cleaning his uh, sprayer, he transferred the fungicide or the pesticides to, to the ground, to the local water, to the creeks. Very dangerous. Another one is um, frequency of spraying fungicides can pose a threat to the natural environment, mainly the soil, by promoting the accumulation of and migration of toxic substances in the ecosystems. Yeah, uh, when the farmer usually does this, because usually the fungicide and the pesticides has a longevity of seven to 14 days, meaning after seven or 14 days, you have to spray again because the effects, uh, the, the active ingredient is no longer available or meaning uh, it cannot fight the, the pest or the fungus anymore. So that's why the farmer has to spray again. So imagine this, twice or thrice a month, the farmer damages the environment by spraying fungicide and pesticides. So that's very dangerous practices of a farmer. Also, another problem of the farmer is the nutritional problem of the soil, meaning there is not enough nutrients or elements. The basic elements of the fertilizer are what we call the NPK. These are the basic nutrients or what we call the macronutrients because the plants need these elements in big numbers. What are the NPK? NPK is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So meaning if this NPK and even the micronutrients, which includes calcium, magnesium, boron, magne uh, boron, molybdenum, zinc, copper, sulfur, these are micronutrients. The lack of the macro and the micronutrients would uh, have an effect on the plants. They would look, see the picture, they would look, uh, instead of being green, they would look like yellow. They would not grow as planned or as scheduled and they will not bear fruit as what we expect them to be because there is a, a lack of food. It's the same thing for, for people. Uh, if you don't feed the person enough food, magiging malnourished siya. So it's the same thing with plants because the fertilizers are the food of the plants. So because of the lack of nutrients, of course, how does the farmer, how, how does the soil 
loses its nutrients. Of course, if you keep on planting the same plant, the same plant would eventually require the same nutrients from the soil. So imagine this, if you plant corn now, and then after harvest, you plant corn again, so it will probably extract the same type of fertilizers or amount of fertilizer it needs to grow. So imagine if you keep on doing, keep on planting corn, at the same time, you don't rotate the plants. You kill the soil, meaning uh, uh, the nutrients required for that plant, it's like, it's like this. You throw the M&Ms in one bowl. M&M candies has so many colors. What if you are a picky person? You only want to eat the same person who keeps on eating that, there will be no more yellow chocolates available. So what if there's no more yellow chocolates, you, 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 you start not to eat because you only want yellow chocolates. So that's the same thing as the plants. So what they do, what the farmers do is they throw in fertilizer. In this point, they, okay, I'll just add more yellow chocolates for, for you to eat continuously. So uh, at some point, it can be all right, but sometimes the farmer doesn't know uh, the exact amount to throw in. So they just, they just throw the fertilizer in the soil, not knowing, oh, they are over-fertilizing already. And that's the point when you over-fertilize you start to make the soil acid, naging acidic ang soil. And when the soil becomes acidic, the organic matter in the plant starts to die. So when it starts to die, there is no more biodiversity. The, 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 the insects that used to be there to help make a good environment for the plant will, be, will no longer be there because of the situation of the soil, which is acidic. Siyempre, kung ikaw, uh, you're, you're, you're inside a room that's very hot. What will you do? You go out. So the insect is the same thing. If the environment for me to live in is not suited for me anymore, it's uncomfortable, uncomfortable for me because the soil is acidic, I will go out. So the good insects will migrate out. So that happens when... Uh, when we use chemical fertilizers. So the effects of chemical fertilizers for the environment, uh, the summary here is uh, fertilization may affect the accumulation also of heavy metals in soil and plant systems. In fact, uh, recently I, I, I registered, uh, I, I did some tests for, for a fertilizer and then uh, it's required from us to also test heavy metals. What are these? Mercury, cadmium, lead. So these are the heavy metals that are being checked because they are, they are harmful for the environment. Also, excessive use of chemical fertilizers has led to several issues such as serious soil degradation, just like what I told you earlier. Nitrogen leaching, soil compaction. When you say soil compaction, the soil becomes too hard. And when the soil becomes too hard because there is no more insects uh, moving around to make it porous, uh, the plants will eventually die, die because there is no room for air because the roots does not only take in nutrients, water, they also take in air. Also, there is reduction of soil organic matter and loss of soil carbon. So these are the basic things that happens when we overdo the use of fertilizer, chemical fertilizers. Okay. Now, there is also the problem with weeds. So when there are weeds or what you call hilamon, anong pinakamadali, we spray herbicides. The herbicides are the one who kills the herb, the weeds, so that it will not uh, be prevalent in your farm. Because, you know, uh, we have, as farmers, we have to remove the weeds for two purposes. Number one, it, uh, it also eats up the nutrients or the fertilizers that you put into the fertilizer. It competes for the nutrients in the soil. Second, the weeds are also alternative houses of the pest. So they hide there. They reproduce in, in the weeds. So when they reproduce that much, it's, it becomes a problem for the farmer. 
And the easiest thing for a farmer to do after the harvest, burning. As, as you can see, after the harvest in the rice field, what does the farmer do? They burn the rice hay. Because it's the simplest way to do it. But burning, number one, it adds to the carbon imprint in the air. And also it also kills the micronutrients or the micro uh, effective micro uh, organisms in the soil because of burning. So what the farmers usually do is like this, no? Uh, they just spray, spray herbicides. So what is the effect for the environment? Number one, herbicides are designed specifically to minimize plant diversity by controlling weeds, thus promoting monoculture. So when I say monoculture, it happens because you want to kill the weeds. The, uh, the weeds are, an, are other plant species. So what will remain are the plants that you want to, that you are cultivating. So that becomes monoculture. Other uh, types of plants will no longer available because you already killed them using the herbicides. This is a problem with monoculture. When you have monoculture, uh, pests are more prevalent in a, a monoculture plantation. Why? Because kung ikaw yung pest, ah, yung favorite food ko na andoon. So we as the pest would go there because we know that our favorite food is there. Okay? So that's, that's the problem of monoculture. Also, spray of herbicides uh, indirectly decrease populations and diversity of related soil organisms and lessen the natural input of organic matter into the soil as well as uh, have directed effects on soil organisms. Yes, it kills the effective organisms in the soil. You, can, you know, there are small organisms in the soil that help decompose the soil and make it an, into a good organic matter. Uh, in, in just inside the soil, there is already a good uh, environment for, for these microorganisms. Applying herbicides, pesticides, and fungicides can kill uh, the creatures. Uh, although microscopic, they have beneficial uh, things that they do for the plants. So that is why it's very important that we also maintain the effective microorganisms in the soil. Now, having said that, so, okay, what will the farmer do? Uh, what if I have pests? What if I have a, a fungus problem? What if I have a lack of nutrients in my soil? What, what will I do as a farmer? Of course, I have to do something or else I will not have a good harvest. So this is where organic farming came in. When we say organic farming, it's the production of crops and livestock without the use of synthetic chemicals and inorganic fertilizers or what we call chemical fertilizers. Organic farming was practiced in India thousands of years ago. As I said earlier, um, in the early ages, wala namang pesticides, wala namang chemical fertilizers, but how come uh, they can harvest good production? So, di lang nila alam, they are already practicing organic agriculture. Also, agriculture was practiced using organic techniques where the fertilizers, the pesticides were obtained from plant and animal products, meaning the farmer can have an alternative, meaning they can make their own pesticides, fungicides, fertilizer that they need through uh, plant and animal products, extracts, or what we call concoctions and extracts. So let me give you an example of these concoctions and extracts that we do. Basically, uh, here at Efrata Farms, we teach organic agriculture production and C2. We teach our students, our uh, test scholars, how to make these uh, concoctions and extracts uh, that they can be alternative pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers. Fertilizers that promote growth, growth hormone, that promotes... Uh, flowering that, that, that makes the, the fruit bigger and sweeter, things like that. So an alternative to pesticides and fungicides. So to kill the pest and fungus, we, we do this. No? 
we call it oriental herb nutrient or what we call OHN. It's just a combination of ginger, sugar, molasses. Uh, when we say sugar, it's brown sugar. Water and garlic. Nidikdik lang namin. We put them together and we ferment them for uh, 15 days, 7 to 15 days. And after that, we extract this uh, the, the liquid that we get from there. And with this, it's already concentrate. Uh, with application of two tablespoons per liter of water, that's what we use to spray in our plants. So the good thing about this, this is organic. As you can see, the materials, they are available readily available. And the good thing about this, walang overdose. Even though it leaches to the soil, uh, it, it doesn't have a negative effect because they are natural uh, pesticides and fungicides. So usually, we can spray this once or twice a week. We spray this uh, early in the morning. When you say early in the morning, that's around 5 to 7 a.m. and late in the afternoon. Because early in the morning and late in the afternoon, that's the time the stomata or the opening of the leaves of the plant or in, in us, for us, no, it's, they are the mouth of the plants. Those are the times that the, the plants have open stomata. Because if you spray midday, they are closed. Kahit feed mo siya ng fertilizer, the plant won't eat. So that's why we, we have to spray early in the morning or late in the afternoon for the plant to maximize this. And also, the pests are only active during the early uh, morning and late in the afternoon. Because usually, wala ka makikitang pests na masyada naglilipad pag tanghali because of the heat of the sun. What they do during, uh, after 7 p uh, 7 a.m., they hide Somewhere they hide under the weeds, they hide under the leaves, and they become inactive. So, so that's why we spray only in the early in the morning. Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, how to do this. If, if you want to practice this, you can Google this. No? So it's, it's just simple. No? Lalagyan mo lang ginger, Sibuyas, molasses, water, add and ferment it. And then you just spray or kahit ibilig mo sa plant, it will do. Sometimes, if the pests are so prevalent, we add chilies, sili, labuyo, chinachap namin. We add it in the OHN and spray it. Imagine just the contact of that uh, liquid to the worm will kill the worm instantly. I've tried it. Okay, so... What is now the alternative of the farmer when there are prevalent weeds? Okay. So usually, if, if you don't want uh, uh, what do you call this uh, weeds, and then you don't want to spray uh, herbicides, you use plastic mulching like this. You see the silver lining? Okay. This is what we do. We cover we cover our plots with this plastic mulching. There are two benefits of using the plastic mulching. Number one, it prevents the weeds from growing kasi hindi na siya naaarawan. When there is no availability of sunlight, it doesn't grow well. So that's why the, the weeds uh, ay hindi nag-grow nag, uh, when they are under the plastic mulch. Also, it maintains the moisture content of the soil fast. It saves you a lot of water. Meaning, if you see your soil na is still wet, you really don't have to, to, to water it as, as, uh, regularly because the, the waters are preserved. Say, in this na mag-evaporate siya when there's plastic mulching, uh, instead of evaporating, it comes back kasi nga may, may takip. No? So that's the benefit of plastic mulching. So when you use plastic mulching, you minimize the, the use of Herbicides, you don't have to spray anymore. Okay, so another method is what we call to, to an alternative to herbicides and burning is, of course, manual weeding. Wala nang gagaling pa sa kamay mo na bubunutin mo yung weeds. Sigurado kang weeds. And this is what the, some big farms do. No, they do mechanical weeding, meaning 
they have machineries that is specifically designed to remove the weeds, right? Okay, now, what's the alternative to chemical fertilizer? What if the plant would require uh, fertilizer? What will you feed them? Well, actually, we can create our own fertilizer through compost. Compost is a mixture of ingredients used to fertilize and improve the soil. It is commonly prepared by decomposing plant and food waste and recycling organic materials. Okay, what we do here, meaning all things that are biodegradable can be placed to the compost. But as a farmer, if you're a good farmer, there is a good mix of compost that you must create. We have this ratio of 70-30. 70% 70 comes from carbon inputs. 30% comes from nitrogen inputs. To simply put it into a good perspective, when a good source of nitrogen are all the, the feces of uh, of the animals, animals like chicken, cows, pigs, goats, rabbits, they are usable. So you might ask, we use human waste. Uh, we cannot, no? according to, to the Philippine National Service for Organic Agriculture, we cannot use human waste as uh, an input for compost or fertilizer because there are so many things that we eat, chemicals, synthetic things that we eat, and that they would be detrimental also in the, the fertilizer that will be produced. And medyo, you know, if you, if you make your compost from your own shit, okay? And then also, the, the feces of the dogs and cats are also allowed uh, for, for this purpose. So... So these are nitrogen. So what are the carbon, carbon uh, materials? Carbon like uh, old paper, old cardboards, uh, dried leaves, uh, all these things. No, even kitchen waste they can be used. And if, yeah. if you combine them and let the microorganisms work their way, in three to six months you will have a soil-like compost. So you cannot imagine. That, uh, these are garbage, and then after six months of making it in placing it in a compost pit, it will become a soil like thing, no? And then you can actually plant, uh, plant there, no? Mabubuhay siya, and it's very rich in fertilizer. So the basic is what we call the compost mixture of, of uh, uh, nitrogen and carbon inputs. Now, if you add worms, it's not compost anymore. We call it vermicomposting. Vermicomposting is an organic and biological process in which earthworms, specifically we use a species what we call ANC or African Nightcrawler. They are very much suited to be uh, the, the earthworms for composting uh, because they convert organic matter or biodegradable waste into manure. The produce... Uh, they produce vermicompost are rich in nutrition and thus they are widely used as biofertilizers in organic farming. Okay, number one, why, why go into vermicomposting? As I said earlier, in composting, it's a longer process. It's like three to six months. But if you add worms, it will hasten your job. Why? Because these worms eat those biodegradable things and and converts it into the, their stomach and put let it out and that becomes the fertilizer so adding worms would hasten the process of composting so mas mabilis no in fact if you gather the poo of the the earthworm it's so easy to gather no because the earthworm usually poos goes up of the top of the soil and poos there. No, you can easily gather them. They are like fine uh, grains of sand. No, they're what we call vermicast. They are very rich in nitrogen, so it's a good alternative to fertilizer. So imagine instead of using 
and buying chemical fertilizers, you can convert your waste into fertilizers and use them for your plants. Okay. Here's another thing that we use here at Ethita Farms. We call it the, the effective microorganisms or the EM technology. This technology uh, from, from Japan, which uh, taps the potential of three types of microbes, specifically the yeast, the phototrophic bacteria, and, and the lactobacilli bacteria. EM is a unique composition of diverse group of bacteria, which is the yeast uh, and fungi, which has been thoroughly tested and proven safe for human and animals. One of the strengths of EM or effective microorganisms is that it is a diverse combination of microbes and it's, uh, this gives its ver versatility in terms of wide scope of applications that it can be used on. Also, EMS was developed to improve the soil and enhance crops, but has evolved to benefit a wide range of areas. Because initially, it was just developed to improve the composition of the soil. Little did they know that they have many other functions, which I'll share to you later. So the composition of EM is like this. It's a combination of lactic acid bacteria, yeast, and phototropic bacteria. Combining these three types of bacteria or microorganisms is what the PM power, EM power. That's the principle of uh, micro, the M microorganisms. Okay, let's... Um, discuss them one by one. When you say lactic acid bacteria, one component of the EM, lactic acid bacteria matter by fermentation and the barrier of lactic acid keeps harmful microbes away. Meaning, it helps in uh, uh, para mabulok or to decompose yung mga biodegradable things that you put in the, your, your compost. And at the same time, it also shields the bad microbes away instead of uh, infect yung, uh, yung compost mo. So that's the purpose of lactic acid bacteria. Now, the yeast, on the other hand, decompose organic matter by fermentation and produce the bioactive substance, substance hormones and enzymes that are needed by the plants to enhance their growth. So that's the second uh, component of EM. Now the third component is what we call phototrophic. When you say phototropic bacteria, these are bacteria that are that uh, that are sensitive to light. You know? So for example, uh, every time we have kitchen garbage, uh, animal sheds or sludges, uh, what does it do? You know? It gives expensive smell. Mabahu talaga. Even our trash can inside our kitchen. Uh, after a few days that you keep on putting stuff there, after a while, it becomes really uh, mabaho. It uh, brings out an offensive smell. Now, what does the phototropic bacteria do? The phototropic bacteria, uh, uh, they eat the hydrogen sulfide and the ammonia that these are the gases na mabaho, no? And then they convert it into an odorless gas. That's why when you put EM to your garbage, instead of uh, nagbibigay siya ng foul smell during the decomposition, nawawala yung mabahong amoy. So imagine the power of these three types of uh, microorganisms. They combine into an EM. And this is what we, we, we do, no? So that's what we call the EM power, the lactic acid bacteria, phototropic bacteria, and the yeast. Okay, so paano ba ginagawa yung EM? Kasi sabi ako, hamba, sa, um, keep on saying EM, EM. How, what does it look like? Actually, EM is uh, commercially available. No? You buy usually this one liter of EM1. Kumbaga, this is the, the primary main component of your EM. And it can be multiplied 10,000 or 1,000 uh, times. No? Meaning your 1 liter EM, you can convert it into 1,000 or 10,000 liters depending on the type of uses that you do. So what, how to prepare your EM? 
Now, from the main solution, we call it EM1. No? It's just uh, 1 to 5%. You add 90% water and you add molasses. So it's 1, 1 to 5% also. From our practice, imagine 30 ml of EM1. You add to 1 liter of water and 30 ml or 30 grams of molasses or brown sugar. You add them together and you ferment them for one week. That's the solution that you can spray to your plants. You can feed to your to your chickens and your and your uh, your pigs, no. And uh, it will will help. It helps us in in this way. Let me show you the the good uh, the advantages of using EM in in your farm. In fact, EM can be used also in your household. Number one, EM can be used as home site home sanitation uh, do you sometimes smell something coming out of your drainage in your bathroom parang mabaho parang nabubulok no yeah because these are the sludges inside the pipes they bring out a bad smell no what we do nilalagyan namin ng EM solution yung sludges then after a while like here in the kitchen nawawala yung mabahong amoy because the EM uh, eats those uh, harmful gases na mabaho, like the ammonia, hydrogen sulfide gases. It, it doesn't smell bad anymore. Now, how do we apply this for plant? For general uh, plant health, imagine just 30, uh, 1 ml of uh, that solution to uh, 1 liter of water, nahalo mo lang, and then dinidilig mo, uh, it helps the, the, the growth of the plant. And also, we use EM for composting. Imagine you have a composting, compost peat there. It usually decomposes in three to six months. If we spray EM on our compost peat, it will hasten the decomposition process. And at the same time, the bad smell uh, is gone during the decomposition period. And the good thing about this is... Uh, if you spray EM to your compost pit, uh, the flies are not attracted to your compost pit anymore. So, nagtataka ka, basura, bakit hindi nila lang? Because there is an EM. Now, we also use EM for our livestock. You say livestock, the chickens, the goats, the pigs. We add as an additive to their water and to their, to their food. Ano nangyayari? Instead of the water or the feces going out with a bad smell, nawawala na yung mabahong amoy because sa chan pa lang nila, uh, the three types of bacteria or microbes are actively working. So that's why uh, nawawala yung mabahong amoy. And this is what we call, this is what we have in our farm, no? ang babuyang walang amoy. Imagine usually, if you have a piggery, when you go inside the pig, piggery house, amoy baboy talaga, no? Uh, mabaho, madaming langaw. But if you have EM, you keep on spraying the floor of your, uh, your, your pig house, your poultry house, you feed EM to your chickens and to your pigs. Hindi siya amoy mabaho. And then the good thing about this, hindi nila langaw yung house ng pig. And, because... I don't know for the reason, ayaw nila yung amoy ng, uh, ng EM. For me, if you smell EM, it's like a, a sour, sweet smell. Ganun ang amoy ng EM. Okay. Also, we use it in, uh, for dogs, cats, and rabbits. No? Uh, you, you add them in, in, in their water or in their food. Yun nga. Uh, it, it gives a... a a good uh, what do you call this? Uh, it promotes good health for for your for your pets. Now, for the environment, let me show you this picture. Because we also use EM to clean our canals. Imagine yung mga uh, barangay canals and even the creeks. Look at the picture on the left. These are this is the the site of the creek prior to spraying or putting EM on, on the water. Now, after 21 days of application, you will see that the water is more clearer. So, nabubuk yung uh, microbes doon 
and uh, it it makes the water clear. So in in uh, in Thailand, this is what they do. No, they throw in so many liters of EM in their canals to make it like this. So this is probably one way that we can help our our environment. Now, uh, in conclusion to my talk, uh, organic farming can be an alternative to the conventional farming that uses chemical pesticides and fertilizers. So this is a decision for the farmer. So he has to decide, no? is my farm going to be uh, organic, going to practice organic farming, or am I, am I going to use uh, chemicals? Uh, for, for my farming practices. So this, this is a, what do you call this? Decision the farmer has to make. And also, we can protect the environment by not using harmful chemicals. As I've discussed earlier, uh, the effects of harmful chemicals to the environment. And sometimes in, in the farming business, these are the things that uh, we sometimes cannot stop using because there is a need for it. But if, if uh, you have this heart for the environment, probably you would, uh, there's a, a, what do we call this, good agricultural practice that, that we can follow. That, that way we can prevent the, the harmful effects of the chemical inputs that we put in our farm. So with that, thank you very much again for this opportunity that I can share to you the the friendly, environmental friendly farming practices that we do here at Ephrata Farms. I'm now open for questions from all of you. Thank you very much, engineer, for that very um, full of knowledge talk for the entire participants and so us to us as a organizers. Well, at this point of time, can I request for a slide, please? Well, at this point of time, may I call on our e-evaluation, Mayra P. Paradero, MMHRM for an open forum. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> All I can say is that to engineer Kanyoto, a very big wow, <laughs> a very, very big wow, sir, uh, engineer, uh, for that uh, very sound, interesting topic, no? which uh, is very helpful for every individual with your topic about Ephrata Farms environmental friendly farming practices. It is indeed a very fruitful. No, learnings, especially for the students uh, who participated this afternoon. Okay, so to everyone here in our Zoom meeting room, we're now going to begin the open forum. As a reminder, you may click the raise hand button for you to be acknowledged, or you can submit questions in our Zoom chat box. All participants are uh, reminded to introduce uh, yourselves first together with what uh, school or organization you are from before asking your questions. Uh, we will check if who is already uh, ready for the question. Okay, uh, may we call in uh, uh, Doki Michael? Bilarmino for the first question. Doki Michael, are you around? Yes. Thank you, Doki Myra. Thank so, you. Good, afternoon, Thank you. Speaker, good afternoon, our speaker, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Sir, my question is since we are talking about the friendly, environmentally friendly farming, so do you think for all those um, good uh, benefits of good farming, what farming method? is the most environmentally friendly for you, which may or will may benefit the farmers? Okay. Um, usually, specific, specifically for uh, small or small to medium farms, 
the practice of doing organic farming would be number one, the most beneficial for the environment. At the same time, for for the for, for those starting in, in farming, organic farming would be also beneficial to them in, in such a way that uh, it will be less expensive because um, the inputs you need for organic farming are readily available in your um, in your surroundings, like uh, the raw materials needed to produce this type of fertilizers are just there around you. The microbes are just there. You just have to harvest them. So basically, uh, it's uh, a cheaper alternative for would-be or starting uh, starting uh, farmers who, who would like to be farmers to start with organic farming because there's less inputs. Because number one, you don't have to buy the fertilizer. You don't have to buy the pesticides or all these things that you need to buy, you know. You can do this in your small scale. The only problem with practicing organic farming is when it becomes a large scale already, meaning hectares and hectares of uh, plantation, it becomes very difficult to, to practice organic farming. As, uh, as from our experience, as you, you grow your, your farm and uh, uh, the area of your farm becomes big, it's really more difficult to practice organic farming now because uh, you have to have a lot of inputs already. Sometimes uh, imagine us, uh, kung small farm ka lang, no? okay lang yung itin ng manok mo, i-gather mo. No? But imagine us, we at one point have to go to a poultry farm, many poultry farms, to buy their chicken dung. And kami pa nagahakot to bring it here in the farm. Kasi the inputs of our chicken farming from our chicken ay kulang na because we are expanding our operation. So kung maliit lang, it's more beneficial to start with organic farming. I hope I answered your question, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Duki Michael. And thank you, Engineer Kanyoto, for that uh, very uh, informative and enlightened uh, answer to the question of uh, Doki Michael. Okay, I think uh, may I call in uh, Doki Noli for his question. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Sir, here is my question. Uh, what is the impact of climate change? in a friendly farming no? or agriculture and uh, food security and what should farmers do to prepare for the adverse climate change or trends okay well we are experiencing the effects of climate change now as we speak no? uh, before uh, when we planted our first experience was when we planted our dragon fruit our first harvest was okay. But then again, during the second season, El Nino struck us. And really long summer. And then even now, uh, the weather is so unpredictable. Even it's, when it's supposed to rain, uh, it doesn't rain. When you're expecting it not to rain, it rains during summer. So that's the effect of climate change. There's a shift already in the... Um, uh, in, in the pattern of our weather. In fact, we've, before hindi kami binabaha, no? but there was one time that uh, because of La Nina, all our plantations were really flooded because of uh, continuous heavy pouring of rain. So what are the mitigations that we do? No? Uh, so this is where modern farming comes in. So that is why for modern farmers, they have to practice uh, uh, modern uh, farming practices. Number one, we maximize our produce by putting them in the greenhouse. Because in the greenhouse, may tinatag tayo, walang kontratsyempo. Uh, even though it, it rains a lot, uh, it doesn't matter because it's covered. And then, uh, when it's too hot naman, we can still do something in our greenhouse to make it cooler. What we do in our greenhouse, there are controllers 
there are timers. There are things that uh, gadgets that measures the temperature. And when the temp temperature is too hot already, there's something automatic that will uh, <coughs> that will happen. Like uh, there is there will be automatic misting or spraying of fine water inside the greenhouse to cool the water uh, to cool the temperature down. Excuse me. So those are the things that uh, you do. No, you you practice uh, modern farming. Also, another alternative is medyo magastos lang. That's that's uh, that's a time when farmers have to learn indoor farming. Now we do it here already in, in Efrata Farms. When you say indoor, it's literally indoor. So it's inside a a closed room. Uh, where we have a good environment for, for the plants. So, so you say, sir, how will the plants grow without sunlight when it's inside the grow room? We place a specific LED light that simulates the sunlight inside the grow room. So when, when, even when the plants are inside the grow room, we can still, uh, we can still make it grow because we supply the required because the required uh, amount of sunlight or lumens it, it requires for a day, we supply the amount, the right amount of water, um, fertilizer, and temperature. So things like this. So to mitigate climate change, uh, farmers should start practicing modern farming techniques. Uh, that's the future of farming. Okay, thank you, Doc Inoli. And thank, thank you, you, Engineer. I, by the way, I, wait po. Oh. Follow up. <laughs> I have one ahead, question. Ed. Actually, I am very curious, uh, Sir uh, Sir Ed, about um, about Iprata. No? So, uh, I would like to ask, Sir, if do you have video or sample of, uh, I mean, information about Iprata? Better if videos or something? Oh yes, I have it here. I can share it to you. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I can share it. Let me let me look okay, at sir. it. I'll, I'll, stop I'll, I'll stop sharing po so that you can share your speed. Okay, put on one more question to, to... While I'm looking, you can ask one more question. Okay. Then I'll share after that question. Okay, thank you, Doc Inoli. I think uh, may we call in Doc Johanna Grace Sabiliana for her question. Hi, hi, sir. Hi, engineer. I have question, Pa. All right. Um, my question is: What farming practices protect the environment? Okay, going back again, no. Oh. Uh, from a lecture, uh, the doing organic farming is one way uh, we can uh, we can help the environment uh, do its natural course. Because when you do organic farming, you do away with spraying uh, uh, pesticides. You do away with using chemicals, using chemical fertilizers. As, as we know, no, because these are synthetic, uh, they are bad to the environment. So doing that, no, practicing organic farming, uh, one way or the other, you help the environment, no, because you will lessen the imprints of the bad chemicals, heavy metals that goes into our water system, into our soil. So, so that's it. No? <laughs> I hope I answered your question. Thank you, Engineer. Madam Ogidda, salamat. Right. Thank you, uh, Doki Johanna. Thank you, Engineer. I think we have some questions here from our chat box. And it's from Altabas College and uh, Prael de la Cruz. Can we hear from you? You may now have your question. Or I will just read the question. Okay, uh, engineer, 
The question is, is sustainable agriculture more expensive? Sustainable agriculture. Okay. Agriculture, yes. Uh, when you say sustainable agriculture, so that means uh, it's a continuous way of doing agriculture, meaning uh, your what your inputs one way or the other, ikaw din ang susupply. No? So you, you go backward integration and you sometimes do forward integration. Um, basically, <clears throat> if you farm, you should stop start practicing uh, uh, sustainable agriculture. Because if you do, it will become much more expensive to you if you don't practice uh, if you don't practice uh, sustainable agriculture. So, uh, number one, when you do sustainable agriculture, as a farmer, you know your inputs. You know your different inputs. Knowing your inputs na, ah, ito pala yung kailangan ko. Uh, knowing uh, backward integration, I can do things na, ah, I need pala... Uh, the, the, the feces of chicken dungs, uh, pig manure for my soil para to act as fertilizer. So, so what will you do? You add another component in your farm. You add a chicken house, you add a, a piggery house. Uh, in one way, ginawa mo yun, not because of primary may income ka doon, but you need the, the what you get from, from these farms, like uh, yung chicken dung, and the pig manure that you can add to your, your soil as fertilizer. And one other, you can also gain income from, from, uh, from selling your, uh, from selling your, what do you call this, your pigs and your chickens. So uh, it's really important also that uh, as farmers, we should practice uh, sustainable agriculture. Okay. Okay, thank you for that answer, Engineer. And thank you for Prael de la Cruz from Altabas uh, College for the question. I think uh, next, may we call in uh, Doki Jet, this Doki Jet? Yes, ma'am. Okay, may I ask your question now? Okay, sir, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, so if there is, what particular aspect or portion of your farming, sir, or method that you would like to improve? Okay. Well, number one, uh, farming is still uh, needs a lot of uh, human labor. Uh, in the olden days, uh, when you say farming, it's hard labor. So, as much as possible, we want to improve this, our farming methodologies by, <clears throat> number one, uh, lessening the, the manpower needed to do some uh, things na very simple lang. Like what? Imagine mo if you have uh, so many plants of uh, pet chai, pet chai na lang to make it simple. And you know what? <clears throat> At one point, we have one farmer in our, in our farm. No? He starts watering the plants at 7 a.m. It takes him four to five hours just to water everything. Okay. So imagine oh, what that's actually a waste of uh, human resource. Back in. in five hours, four to five hours, he can do a lot more things, more productive. And if you are a modern farmer, you can automate things. No? Na the farmer hasn't to have, uh, does not need to do, to do this um, menial jobs. No? Kasi if you are a modern farmer, you can set up a timer that at 7 a.m. sprinkler that will turn on or that will irrigate everything. Or there's a line that, that has irrigation uh, drip irrigation that will water all your plants. So you save uh, a lot of manpower doing that. Okay? 
So, so that's one, no? Uh, you tap into to modern technology. And <clears throat> isa pa, no? Sometimes it's a waste. Uh, if, uh, ang hirap kasi sa pagtatanim, sa farming. For example, we'll talk about vegetable planting. Vegetable planting from seeds to harvest it's around 45 days. Sometimes the farmer will take time to take care of the seeds hanggang maging seedlings itanim. And sometimes after planting, he forgets the next 30 days and then expects to harvest a good harvest after 30 days. It doesn't work that way. So pag farming, uh, hanggang matapos yung farming timeline, uh, you should put full attention to your to your plants. Otherwise, you will not have a good produce. Not so that's the that's the the science part there, no. Pagkatapos alagaan tanim na farmer, tapos hindi din alagaan ng maayos. Ah, yan lang, no. So meaning all the initial effort na tatlan will be gone to waste, kasi hindi din ma harvest and uh, hindi din ma maayos ang output niya because it wasn't uh, taken care of properly. So these are the things na sinasabi ko. Ay, sayang. Sayang siya. Okay. Thank you, engineer. And thank you also to uh, Doki. Doki Jet. Okay. May we call in Doki Gabi Palacios for the next question? Good afternoon, engineer. Good afternoon, engineer. Good afternoon. Yes. Um, my question is, with the existence of uh, different competition or with the existence of different organic farms in the region, so how you ensure the sustainability of the operation? Of the of your farm. So, uh, that's the irony of it all, no? Uh, uh, the problem is, nakala nila, oh, oh, sige, organic, and it it would it would uh, call for a higher price. But that's a different market here in Region Six, in the Iloilo in the province and in the city. When we started, talaga 100% organic siya. But the problem is, there's no significant uh, price difference for an organic uh, produce as compared to the conventional produce. Kung baga, parehas lang. Dapat uh, in Manila, no? it's usually 30% higher. Uh, the chickens, organic eggs are much expensive. Uh, as compared to the conventional ones. Bakit? Kasi it really takes a lot of effort to do organic farming. Hindi simply ang organic farming, no? Lalo na when you are uh, you have a target to choose, no? You have a target to deliver to, to your supermarket. So it's really difficult to, to do this in a large scale, organic farming. And sometimes uh, you just have to decide na it's it's very difficult. And then another thing is uh, in doing organic farming, if you want to be certified, when you say certified, there is a two certifying bodies here in the Philippines. One is OCCP and the other one is NICER. They are the only certified, they are the companies that certify the farms to be organic. Meaning if they are not, they are not certified by OCCP or NICER, the term or the word organic in your produce. Organic beta, you cannot use it if you are not OCCP or certified. Uh, so, so, so that's the problem, no? And then, it's very expensive to maintain a certified organic farm. Why? As I said earlier, uh, OCCP and NICER are the only one who can uh, uh, certify you to be an organic farm. Every year, you have to have this laboratory test. 
to to certify that indeed you are still practicing organic farming right? they will get samples from your soil they will get samples from from your produce from the leaves and check if there are traces of pesticides or chemicals and then once they see traces of these chemicals uh, pesticides uh, you cannot be certified not just the mere laboratory tests uh, for this thing will, will cost around 100 to 120,000 pesos. So imagine mo, every year you have to do this, ulit ulit. So that's very, a very big uh, investment. No? Now, if that's why organic produce are much expensive dahil sa mga ganito. No? So if you're just a small farm, you cannot afford this. No? Because laboratory expense alone is very expensive. Okay, so in the long run, it will only be sustainable for an organic farm if number one, the, the farm uh, will have a good market. When you say good market, there are already people who recognize that what you are producing are organically grown produce. And uh, with that, they accept that indeed it is much more expensive. Sige lang, kahit mahal, they will continue to buy because they know the benefits of eating organic. So unless you have a good market, a continuous flow of market, uh, it will not be sustainable. Kasi kung produce ka ng produce, tapos wala naman bumibili, o sige, papantay ko na lang doon sa presyo ng kalaban ko na hindi din basta lang mabili kasi sayang din. So that's the only way for organic to be productive. All right? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Engineer. Thank you, Doc Gabi. Uh, I think, Engineer, your uh, video is now ready. Okay. Actually, this is our ads. No? So let me introduce to you our, 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 our company, Efrata Farms. I'm supposed to have another video that would highlight our smart hydro... Smart smart uh what do you call it smart agriculture but uh i didn't the, the 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 hard drive is not available anyway uh come and see this uh video ads at the farms who says kids can travel alone
Wow, that's a nice video. Thank you so much. Thank sir. you, engineer, for sharing that video to us. Thank you but, so much. Okay. Uh, we still have some questions here coming from our participants from Altabas College, a BSHN, uh, from Bernard A. Barrera. The question is, with your experience, I've just increased the volume. With your experience, do you think what type of farming is worse for and uh, for environment if there is any? Okay. Uh, number one, uh, doing monocropping. When you say monocropping, uh, this is the only plant you plant. You plant ka after harvest, plant ulit, same crops. Because when you do this, this is way, with this will actually attract the same type of uh, pests in your in your farm, no? Kasi alam ng pests doon yung pagkain na gusto nila, so they will always go there. And at the same time, that would uh, that plant or species would eat the same uh, amount or or type of uh, fertilizer or element that it needs. Kasi parehas nga, no? Doing that, knowing that that would deplete the, the nutrients of the soil kasi yun lang kinakain niya. Eh, no? So, anong alternatives ng, uh, ng farmer? Input ng chemical fertilizer to sustain the growth of the plants and also input of pesticides because, because ito yung pest na, na, na tawag nito na laging umaatake sa kanila because it's a monocropping uh, per practice. No? So that's why in a good farmer would always practice what we call uh, yung nag-change ka ng crops mo every now and then. No? Hindi lang monocropping. Isa pa, no? like, what they, what, like what they did in uh, Mindanao. I don't know specifically where in Mindanao. They converted their forest into palm plantation, palm, palm tree, specifically for the oil. Little did they know that doing doing that would really harm the environment. It would uh, harm the soil. Kasi yung palm na to, they would, the oils would be extracted sa palm, tumutulo siya sa soil, and then when it leaches the soil, imagine yung soil na puno siya ng oil, do you think may mabubuhay pa na tanim noon kung yung lupa ay puro oil na, puro langis na? So that's one type of farming del mono cropping siya tapos yung crop pa na ginamit is yung palm oil uh, palm na that produces palm oil so it, it's gonna be destructive to the to the environment so meron din no meron ding uh, farming type of farming na destructive sa environment thank you for that uh, another additional learnings for us today engineer no and thank you for the question, uh, Bernard Barrera. And next question from uh, Doki Santa Renea. Hello, Doc. Thank you, Doki Mayra. Good afternoon, Sir Ed, Engineer Ed. Can you Good afternoon, ma'am. Um, my question is, you have mentioned, sir, earlier on your introduction that maintaining the plants is very difficult because of, you know, um, any unavoidable situations. Um, in, in, in any case that these challenges in Ephrata farms occur, how will you be able to overcome these difficulties in terms of your um, business operations? Okay, number one. Um... As, a, as, as the owner or managing the, 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 the operations of the farm, you, you should create the protocols for specific uh, activities you do in the farm. Let's, let's uh, dig into what we do in the, our, our vegetable production for the hydroponics. Now you, you set protocols from day one, what they will do, what is expected from your people. And then, uh, because sometimes... And uh, you have to let your, your people understand what these protocols are. 
Kasi sometimes, bakit kailangan ba natin ito gawin? Hindi naman natin ginagawa before. But little did they know, if you keep that process, you will see what happened, what will happen at the end. No? Ah, kasi hindi mo ginawa ito, ito yung nangyari. No? Sometimes just uh, simple sanitation practice like cleaning of these things, cleaning of the, the, the tools that we use, pag hindi ito ginawa ng, ng farmer kasi tinatamad siya, he doesn't want to follow the protocol, okay. hindi niya finalo because he was not informed initially why those protocols were set. Uh, hindi ko na lang lilinisan itong ano uh, gamit na ito. No? Uh, like uh, like what, 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 what they do in a dragon fruit. Sa dragon fruit, for example, when we shears, we remove the the branches that has diseases. Now, every time you move from one plant to another plant, yung pruning shears mo, ginagawa na, binababad namin, binababad sa percent ng uh, Clorox and water to disinfect the tools. Kasi, if you don't do that, ikaw mismo farmer, ikaw yung nagkakalat ng sakit sa buong farm mo. Imagine this, I'm pruning this plant na may disease, same tool, I will transfer to another plant, ipuprune ko din. So yung the mere fact na dumikit yung tool na yan because hindi siya na-disinfect, uh, tawag nito, you are transferring the, the, the disease to that plant. This is what we do also when we prune our bell peppers. So bell peppers, sometimes you, on a weekly basis, may tinatanggal ka dyan na unnecessary mga growth because you don't need them. What we do every time we transfer to another plant, we dip our hands or fingers into skim milk and then transfer again. Kasi if we don't do that, we would transfer the disease from this plant to another plant. In fact, pag masama na talaga yung plant, hindi na namin siyang inaalagaan, we just remove it and uh, throw them to the fire to, to kill the, to the, the disease. So, so that is why it's very important for, for you to set up the protocols. And when you set up the protocols, you explain to your people why these protocols have been set. Kasi sometimes, sa totoo lang, yung mga farmers, lalo na pag yung matatanda na, uh, sometimes you cannot uh, uh, teach old dogs new tricks, sabi nga nila. No? This is your instruction in the morning. Pagbalik mo na after, afternoon, Iba na naman ginagawa nila. They go back to what they are previously uh, are familiar of doing. It happens to us, no? To the point that uh, one time, we just have to say to our farmers na, pwede ba ako lang yung marunong dito? Makinig kayo sa akin. Kasi kung ayaw nyo makinig sa akin, umalis kayo sa kumpanya na to. <laughs> Sometimes you have to be harsh that way, no? Because... You, you set these protocols because you believe these protocols will help you in managing your, your operations, meeting, uh, uh, eliminate those uh, problems in the future. But here comes your, your worker who doesn't follow your protocol. So you just have to put up the protocols and instill the protocols on your farmers that they have to follow it. All right? Yes, engineer, thank you so much. Thank you, Doki Santarania, and thank you, Engineer, for that uh, another informative answer. No, and yes, it's right. true. No, uh, ang mga Pinoy gitisado tigagitulo. <laughs> they are yes. very hesitant to changes. No, they don't really listen. Okay. Thank That's you, right. Engineer. Uh, I think uh, next may we call in Doki Romel. Doki Rumel, Abaldonado, thank you. Good afternoon, Engineer Ed. Good afternoon, sir. So, this is my question for you, sir. So, what is the advantages and disadvantages of a plata farm from other farm in supplying the demand of every food and beverage establishment? Okay. Advantages, okay. Uh, advantages, okay. So, 
we have uh, set up protocols here na sa farm na, for example, doing producing lettuce. Uh, for us, it's already a simple thing to do, no? Kasi nakaschedule na siya, no? So this advantage, we have the technical knowledge, you have the facility to, to do this. So our advantage there is we can deliver what is required of us. So we, we, we need not uh, go to other places or buy from other farmers because we can produce them by ourselves. Okay. Another uh, disadvantage also, uh, uh, there are dumadami na rin yung mga farmers na ano no na na gumagawa ng back, back backyard farming nila and uh, of course they eat up some of our of our potential income from our produce bakit hindi na sila kailangan bumili pa eh because they can just pick from their from their garden uh, so that becomes disadvantages for us it is a loss of opportunity for us Okay, another uh, advantage para sa amin uh, is we have, we have this uh, expertise na in, in producing. Another advantage for us, we have already a, a good market. When I say a good market, uh, ang farmer kasi, sometimes naka, dyan nagkakamali, no? the farmer forgets that he is supposed to be also a businessman. Hindi lang siya farm producer, but he should think as a businessman, meaning his produce must have a market. Hindi ka lang produce ng produce and then look for a market. Our advantage is, is uh, we have a market already. No? Uh, we've captured, uh, we have uh, SM here in uh, SM City, Iloilo. We have also a branch in uh, SM Save More Haniwai, Kalinog. And before we were we were the initial supplier of fruits and vegetables for one of the supplier of fruits and vegetables for SNR. In fact, when SNR started, all the raw ingredients of uh, their pizza is amin ng gagaling. That was before. So I, I think uh, those are the things that are on top of my mind, sir, in terms of our advantages and disadvantages with other, with other farms. Thank you, Engineer. Thank you, Doki Romel, and thank you, Engineer. Uh, are you are you still okay with the questions? We still have questions from the participants. Okay, kapa Engineer. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. So we have here from Capiz uh, State University, Pontevedra, a uh, BSHM. Uh, the, uh, from Louis J. Burata. Okay, the question is, what is good to do with crops that are ravaged by fungus like ampalaya and how to eliminate it using organic techniques? Okay, there are two methods. No? Number one, uh, it's what you call mechanical method or you eliminate this in such a way that you remove Number one, pag nakita mo na na grabe na yung, yung effect ng fungus sa tanim, you remove the plant because it will probably not give you a good uh, produce when naapektuhan na siya ng, uh, ng fungus. So better, much better, better yet, remove the plant. Uh, so you save time and inputs for it for that particular plant. And when you remove those things, kailangan sinusunog mo, no? Kasi if, if you don't burn and, and uh, ilulubong sa lupa, kakalat lang yan because these fungus are airborne. Okay. For, there's a concoction for, for that. No? The concoction to be used is OHN. So it's a combination of fermented ginger, garlic, uh, uh, may suka pa yan, and then we, we ferment it. If, if you want to learn about OHN, there's uh, a way you can do that in uh, i-google mo lang, OHN or Oriental Herbal Nutrient. So, yun yung sinispray natin sa tanim, no? It's a dual action, no? It's a uh, pesticide and at the same time, it's also a fungicide. 
so that will prevent fungus from uh, from from uh, heart, from, from uh, affecting your plants okay thank you engineer i think we have uh, another question from our colleagues here uh, Ma Mata, can, can you reserve uh, before we end can you reserve five minutes of your time because i want to share to you all video of uh, some advances in technology for our greenhouse our smart greenhouse okay sir sure okay, okay so we have a question here from doki uh, roselin uh, in our farm we are using organic fertilizer we spray bioenzyme to chicken manure and after 15 days it becomes organic fertilizer and smells like systemic fertilizer urea is it somewhat the same with the em1 solution you discussed earlier hmm. uh, question as is is uh, as long as uh, we can see em no it's a kumbaga, it's it's a brand em effective microorganisms or em1 it's a brand no, it's a brand na yun yung components na. So I'm I'm not really sure kung it's it's like EM, no. But uh, if it smells like uh, sweet sour uh, smell, it's probably parang EM din siya, no. Na uh, uh, EM like, no. EM brand name, and we we also have. Uh, uh, uh I, I forgot I forgot the specific term no madami kasi gumagawa niyan may Japanese technology may Korean technology but uh, at the same thing same same principle no they are using or tapping the power of the microbes to to boost uh, organic uh, activity in the soil so most probably, parang parehas lang siguro. Okay. Thank you, engineer. I think uh, Doge Roslin is satisfied with the answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe call in Sister Marley for the next question, please. Sister Marley. Hi, good afternoon, engineer. Good afternoon, sister. Um, <laughs> Because I am also a plantita, but you know, I I have this problem a lot of times that uh, because we don't know, you mentioned earlier that we need to know uh, which plant suits to what kind of land. So yeah. my, my request is, can you give us some tips on how to do that? How to um, know or uh, yeah, how to know what kind of uh, plant will suit to what kind of land or soil. Okay. Uh, basically, if you search in Google, no, most, of, most of the time they will give you the they, they would have the same the same uh, what do you call this uh, description of what type of soil uh, is, is suitable for your plan, no? But if you want to be more technical about it, this is what this is my suggestion, no? If you have a plant, if if you have an area that you that you want to be productive, get a soil sample, have it tested in in DA's uh, soil laboratory. It's uh, near Parola. The there's a soil laboratory in DA, and it's for free, ah. Huh? This is a service of the Department of Agriculture for the farmers. It's a free thing, no? So knowing, knowing that type of soil, it's a laboratory analysis that will give you the specific uh, amount of uh, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and they will also provide you specific suitable plants for that type of soil. So I think that's the most scientific way of doing it, no? Kasi it undergoes a laboratory analysis. No? I've done this in the past. No? I've, I've uh, gathered some soil sample. Maliit lang, no? it, they only require 100 to 200 grams. No? Yung dry po, yung dry na po na, na soil. No? 
you give it to the laboratory, soil laboratory analysis. It's, it's just in front of uh, the city mall in uh, Parola. Doon yung area nila. No? And then, for example, kung, kung ikaw naman may tanim ka na doon, for example, I'm planting corn there. This is the soil sample of my corn, of, of uh, the, the soil where my corn is planted. What DA will do is, okay, they will analyze the, uh, the content of your soil and they will, they will give suggestion. Okay, next time, although hindi siya organic, no, they will give you, you apply uh, so, so much bags of urea, so much bags of complete fertilizer, things like that, for your corn to be productive. But if you don't have an idea what to plant, have your soil anal analyzed first. Okay, sister? Thank you. Thank you, engineer. Thank you, engineer. Thank you, sister. I think we still have another question from Doki uh, Azel Arsenas. Hi, good afternoon, engineer. Good afternoon. Yes, engineer. Actually, I'm from Haniwai, engineer. Ah, lapit lang. <laughs> yes, no. actually, engineer, my question. I, I saw your video presentation. Okay. Uh, good in yung, uh, ano, dragon fruit. Yes. <laughs> Curious lang ako, uh, engineer. Uh, how many times does dragon fruit bear fruit in a year? Okay. Dragon fruit is a seasonal plant. Uh, no? Yes. It, it usually starts flowering at, at the month of March, April. So, it's flower yan siya, no? And yes. by, by May and June, that's the earliest month that we can harvest dragon fruit. Uh -huh. So, up to October you can still harvest a few more dragon fruit. And after that, it, it ends. No? So when, when the harvest, the last harvest of dragon fruit comes, that's the time we prune our dragon fruit. No? You, we remove the twigs that are unnecessary, uh, that has diseases, and then we fertilize again. So that it, will, it will be ready by the next time na mag-season siya. Madami na naman siya mga sanga. Healthy na siya. It, it will bear the flowers. Because more flowers, of course, that means more fruits. So, so it means, uh, it means engineer, uh, once a year lang siya mag, ano, mag, uh, bear fruit. Yes, okay. but there's, just lang kasi ako, uh, there's a technology also, ma'am, that the, if you extend the daytime, meaning, kasi pagdating October, bird na siya, no? Nagsushorten uh, na yung, yung lights, no? They do, they put, they put lights. Yes, in the, uh, farm, no? So that would parang tell the dragon fruit, ay, parang summer pa. So mag, magpo-fruiting pa siya, no? We try, we try this, no? Yung, imagine mo yung Christmas lights, binalot lang namin sa dragon fruit. By accident, parang ginawa namin Christmas tree dragon fruit. By January, meron na kami flower <laughs> kasi yes, yung uh... small light of the Christmas lights, uh, feeling ng, cact ng cactus ay eh, ano pa, summer na. So nag-flower na siya. But if you do an uh, economic analysis about that, it's gonna be not that uh, economical. Kasi naman yung the cost of the number one, the lighting, facility, the electricity, ay uh, baka kukulangin pa sa, pang, sa harvest mo sa dragon fruit. So just, uh, so we just uh, follow the natural course of nature and just harvest on, on the seasonal seasonality of the dragon fruit. Oh, I see. Kay, actually, uh, engineer, uh, mm -hmm. my uncle has uh, 500 uh, dragon fruit. So, nakita ko lang sa kanya, nilalagyan niya ng, ano, na curious lang ako, nilalagyan niya ng ilaw no. isa isa. Okay. Tapos, so, so yun, maraming beses siyang na munga in a year. So, yes. Tapos, meron, actually, engineer, ano, Tanong ko pa po, yung, yung ibang dragon fruit, hanggang pamumulaklak lang sila, hindi sila na, hindi natutuloy yung pamumunga. Ano kaya po yung reason? Kulang sa fertilizer. Oh. Kasi okay. uh, the energy of the plant, yung food niya, no, eh kulang i-sustain yung fruits. That means kulang siya sa fertilizer. Pero pat enough yung kinakain niya na pagkain, yung energy niya na napuproduce, hmm. it will sustain the flower. Yes. Thank you, engineer. All right. Okay, thank you, engineer. May pahabol pa. Uh, can we hear from Doki Mainen? Yes, good afternoon, engineer. 
Good afternoon. Uh, uh, question ko lang, Engineer, is regarding the natural fungicides and pesticides that you have mentioned earlier. So how often do you apply this natural fungicides and pesticides to your plants to maximize its effect before it will arise a problem or if the problem is already there? Okay. Number one, if the problem is already there, uh, twice a week, nagsispray kami. But for maintenance now, na, na mitigate na yung uh, problem, once a week application of OHN will do. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. So thank you, engineer. So I think uh, everybody already presented their uh, questions, no? So wala na siguro may mamangkot. So that would be great. So thank you, everyone. We appreciate your presence today uh, and for being participative. Thank you so much, Engineer Kanyoto, for an inspiring and motivating session with you oh, this afternoon. Can I, yes. can I share my last video? Yes, so sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. What we are doing. Uh, yes, of course, Engineer. Just say it's done. Okay. This is our smart greenhouse technology. This is my everyday routine in my hydroponics farm. Yes, you heard it right. Every day, even on Sundays, I have to constantly take a sample and measure the EC and the pH level of my nutrient solution. If they are not within the required parameters, I have to adjust, adjust, and adjust just to get it right. Sometimes, I have to do this several times a day. This gets very tiring and time-consuming. There must be a better way. I'm Ed Canuto from Efrata Farms. We are located here in the province of Iloilo. Welcome to our smart greenhouse. Hydroponics is planting without the use of soil. We grow lettuce using cocoa bean as a medium in lieu of the soil and feed the plants with hydroponic nutrients. We pursued hydroponics over the conventional method of planting because production would be faster. It would require less labor force and most importantly, plants grow faster and better because nutrients are fed constantly to the plants. With the help of Iloilo Science and Technology University or ESAQ and DOST Picard, we were able to create a smart hydroponics greenhouse. The smart greenhouse uses renewable solar energy to power the system. Internet of Things, or IoT, technology was also tapped to keep me constantly informed on the status of parameters I constantly manually correct before. Parameters like pH, EC, water temperature, humidity of the greenhouse, ambient temperature of the greenhouse, the water flow rate, these data are constantly collected and uploaded to the cloud so we can see the status of our greenhouse anytime, anywhere we are. Because of IoT, I can check the status of my greenhouse using my phone. I can also adjust some parameters even when I'm away from my greenhouse. The advances in technology automated my hydroponic system. Gone are the times I have to constantly manually adjust the parameters. Automating the system also improved the growth of my lettuce. The butterhead lettuce I grew before would only reach about 150 grams per head. Growing it now in our small greenhouse, I was able to improve the weight of the butterhead lettuce from 150 grams to 250 grams per head. That's a 70% increase in its weight. That's a significant improvement because of the perfect growing condition that has been provided to the lettuce. This smart greenhouse technology has greatly helped me as a farmer as it lessened my manual labor. Production cycle is predictable and constant. As an entrepreneur, it lessened my costs as renewable energy is used to power the system. My yield has also increased as I can produce much better and much bigger, heavier lettuce, increasing my sales income. 
I hope many more farmers and agripreneurs would tap into this technology of smart greenhouses and Internet of Things as it gives you better control of your farm. It automates your manual labor, it improves your production cycle by improving your product and improving your income. Wow. Thank you, engineer, for showering your knowledge and your passion to us this afternoon. It is indeed a very uh, heartwarming for me no? uh, because we, you already uh, inspired us. You inspired us with your topic this afternoon. So I will now turn the floor to our uh, to Doki Johanna for the continuation of the program. Thank you very much, engineer Kanyoto. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ma'am Myra. And of course, thank you, Engineer, for a very um, full of knowledge talk for this afternoon's event. Kanami gid sang mga farm engineer. Um, well, at this point of time, may I call on our promotion and publicity chairperson. J. Martin B. Biclar, MBA, for awarding of e certificate of appreciation. <clears throat> Project. Um. Okay. Okay, once again, good afternoon, everyone. So I will present the certificate of appreciation to our speaker. So the public of the Philippines, state universities and colleges, Gimara State University Graduate School Program, McLean Buena Vista Gimaras, awards this certificate of appreciation to Engineer Ed Roderick V. Canyoto for the gift of time and expertise as resource speaker during the DMBA402 webinar on environment management with the theme, Efrata Farms, Green Environmental Management Best Practices, held on August 21, 2022 via Zoom. Presented and given this 21st day of August 2022. Signed, Jet L. Disokatan, MBA, Webinar Chairperson. Signed, Gabby Palacios, MD, MBA, HACHA, Webinar Co-Chairperson. Signed, Gina B. Montes, EDDHD BM, the MBA 402 professor. And signed in the again. Sir. Okay, na, sir. Okay, na, sir. Are you done? You're done Thank sir. you very much, Sir Jet, for um awarding the e certificate of appreciation. Well, at this point of time, Sir Anthony Wang Espanola, MSHM, our technical arrangement chairperson, will going to lead us in our group photo opportunity and e evaluation. All right. Again, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much for 
listening to our uh, last speaker. Thank you also to Sir to Engineer Ed for such a wonderful uh, sharing experience we had. Okay. We will be having our photo opportunity, but before that, may I request all students to please kindly check your chat box as I have posted the e-evaluation form and uh, you will be receiving your third set of certificate. All right, so moving forward, may I request all the students, organizers, advi our advisor and speakers to please turn on their cameras as we will be having our photo opportunity. All right. Okay. How about others? Please don't be shy. Turn on your camera. The more the merrier. All right. Okay, let's start. On to the first panel in three, two, one. Smile. Okay, on to our second panel in three, two, one. All right, moving on to our last panel. Okay, and three, two, one, smile. All right. Thank you very much. May I request all the students to please turn off their cameras to give way for the organizer, speaker, and advisor to have their own photo opportunity. All right. Okay, let me see the beautiful and happy faces of our organizers. Okay, and three, two, one. Perfect. Thank you very much. Back to you, Doki Johanna. Thank you very much, Sir Anthony. Engineer, we would like in behalf of the DMBA class 402, we would like to say thank you for gracing us of your today's presence, for exerting your effort, time, and experiences to all of us. Engineer, thank you so much from the bottom of our heart. We okay, at this... If you remember, if you remember we had visited your place. Yes. So that you can share your good practices, your farming practices, as well as your, your very nice place and property. So we're so happy that you said yes to us. Thank you so much, engineer. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, at this point of time, our documentation and compilation chairperson, Mom Azel M. Arsenias, MHM, will be awarding of a certificate of participation. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Ma'am Johanna, can I flash the certificate? Oh, nadula. Okay, the certificate reads Republic of the Philippines State Universities and Colleges, Guimaras State University, Graduate School Program, McLean Benavista Guimaras. Certificate of Participation is hereby given to Sybil Ann A. Ramirez, MBA HTM CGSP, for having actively participated during the DMBA 402 <laughs> webinar on environmental management held on August 21, 2022 via Zoom, given this 21st day of August of the year 2022. Signed. Jet L. Desicutan, MBA, Webinar Chairperson, signed Gabby P. Palacios, MD, MBA, HACHA, -H -H Webinar Co-Chairperson, 
and sign Annalyn A. Hanaban, DMBA HRM, DMBA Program Head, and Dr. Early M. Martyr, Dean of Graduate School, and of course, Dr. Gina B. Montes, our DMBA 402 professor. Thank you. Back to Doki Johanna. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mom Azel. At this moment, our professor and advisor of DMBA 402 in Environmental Management, <clears throat> Dr. Gina B. Montes, will be awarding of his certificate of recognition. Um, <clears throat> sorry, Dr. Jeff, can you please do the honor of the distribution of the certificate of participation to other participants, please? Okay, ma'am. Okay, <coughs> ma'am. Okay. Next slide. Um, Next slide. For Next slide, please. Same certificate is awarded to Gabi P. Balacios, MD, MBA, HA, CHA. Same certificate is awarded to Joanna Grace G. Haviliana, MBA. Same certificate is awarded to Mr. Nolly BDS Jr. MBA as our technical chairperson. Same certificate is awarded to Mr. Anthony Y. Española MSHM as our technical chairperson. Tapos na sila. Ate, ang mga order tadi niya. Ma'am Jo. Project, are you done? Okay, thank you very much, Sir Jet. At this moment, may we call on our professor, our Dr. Gabby P. Palacios, MD, MBA, CHA, for our webinar co chair for person for her closing remarks. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Until 
on behalf of the MBA402, I would I would like to uh, express our heartfelt gratitude to our participants coming from different institutions and uh, most especially to our speakers for today. Honorable Jose Manuel F. Alba, Mr. Rhett Arthur Diana, and Engineer Ed Roderick Cagnotto. Thank you so much for your time and for sharing your expertise. Your topics are of great importance in the promotion of environmental management, most especially the processes and the practices that uh, enable us to at least reduce our environmental Im impacts. Again, uh, I would like to congratulate uh, the members of the committee of this webinar um, session for today. And thank you so much for your time. And uh, may God bless us all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doc Dabi. And thank you, everyone, to our dear participants. Deans, faculties, and staffs of different state universities and companies, we would like to say thank you for your presence and your time to be with us in our webinar. I, your Lady of Ceremony, is saying have a good day and I hope, I hope you have lots of learnings in today's event. Thank you. At this juncture, may we call, may I call on Doc Gina Montes for the evaluation and feedbacking. Mom, hola, ride your mommy. At this point, we would like to give affirmation and commendation to the hardworking, committed, and passionate men and women of the Doctor of Management and Business Administration 402, Environmental Management of the Gimara State University. The working force behind the success of today's webinar. So, hope that you can still flash citations. If not, I will just make my own citation. Anyway, so citation reads, Yamara State University, Doctor of Management in Business Administration, would like to award this certificate of recognition to the following working committees for their significant contribution for their um, service passionate service as working committee for the webinar and the MBA 402 environmental management, which is given today, August 21, 2022, which is also being held here at the Zoom. So I would like to call in the different working committees. And I would like to start with the webinar. Doctor, a doctor. Jet Desukatan, MBA. Doc, um, again, for the webinar chairperson, Jet L. MBA. For the webinar chairperson, Gabby P. Palacios, M. Dr. Gabby Palacios, MBA, HACHA. -H -H 
for the mass service ceremony and the technical arrangement chairperson, Johanna Grace G. Javiliana, MBA. For the technical arrangement chairperson, Noli P. D. S. Jr., MBA. For the technical arrangement by Hispaniola, MSHM. To the e registration chairperson, Merichi S. Pinaranda, MBA. For the e program chairperson, Mainen G. Labugin, MBA. For the e-evaluation person, HRM. I hope that they can also show the certificate in order, the certificates which is made by um, Duki Santa in recognition also to his effort. I hope that the certificates will be also be seen on the screen. And for the e-certificate chairperson, Santa Renea C. Tobalinal, MBA. So the invitation and e-poser is Zoom background chairperson, Rosalind G. Abuan, MBA. So the documentation and compilation chairperson, Cybel Ann A. Ramirez, MBA, HTM, CGSP. So the documentation and compilation chairperson, Michael M. Villarmino, MBAHM. To the documentation and compilation chairperson, Ishel M. Arsenas, MHM. To the budget and finance, to the budget and finance chairperson, Sister Marley Satur, AR, LPTMM. To the promotion and publicity chairperson, Romel V. Abaldonado, MBAHM. To the promotion publicity chairperson, J. Martin P. B. Clark, MBA. And also, we would like to acknowledge also the administrators of the Gimara State University for approving our paper, for allowing us to have this webinar. So for the university president, Dr. Lilian Diana P. Parinio, to the vice president of academic affairs, Dr. Rodi Catalan, for the Dean of the Graduate School, Dean Dr. Early M. Martir, and to the DMBA Program Head, Dr. Aniline A. Hanapan. And uh, our deepest um, appreciation also to our speakers for today. So in the morning, we have Congressman Alba, and in the afternoon, um, of course, we have Engineer Kanyoto, and then at one, one o'clock, we have also um, Mr. Dayane of the PENDO. And for all the, the administrators and to all the faculty and to all the students who have attended um, the webinar, which is organized by the DMBA for O2 Environmental Management student of the Guimara State University, our appreciation and commendation to each and every one of you. Thank you for being a part of this successful activity. God bless everyone and mabuhay. Thank you so much, Doc. Um, on behalf of Eros Lin, Doc, I would like to share uh, this one comment. Since Doki Roslyn is not around po, so I will be the one who will share this on behalf of everyone po. So we would like to also share this certificate to you, um, Doc Gina, as an appreciation for all of your uh, efforts in understanding us and for all of your guidance especially since most of us are still new to this kind of event and also for your dedication to really teach us uh, second time and also this summer so we'd like to award this certificate of appreciation to you doc gina b montes uh, for the gift of time and ending patience, understanding and guidance to the students of the MBA class for the mid-semester school year 2021-2022, given this 20th day of August 2022. Yours forever grateful, the MBA 400 and 402 students 
we love you and God bless you more. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate the, your token of appreciation. Uh, Thank may you, I know, May I know who's not in, the, in, in our room? Are we all complete? Sinong kulang sa aton? Dr. Roslyn. Dr. Roslyn, who else? Dr. Merit is around. Kedo brown out man to kuno. Then brown out me signal. Ha? Si Dr. Merit, Doc. Ah, kay may, may data siya guro. Data, so, data gamit uh -oh. to Doc. I think that's good. Mm -mm. So, sino lang ang kulang sa aton? Sino lang ang kulang? Si Doki Roslyn ng GED? Doki, Jeff. Tuwa ka mo din ni Anthony. Ah, okay. Ma'am. Doki, Jeff. Sino Doki, Jeff ang wala? Ari ko, Dayami. Ang si, ano ya, si Doki, Jeff ng 1P. J. Martin Biclar ang wala. Wala siya. Naa siya, Doki. Na Jefferson Arroyo. Na si Jefferson Arroyo, sino ni siya? I-remove ko siya. I-remove ko siya. Okay. Ay, nag-leave. Ari na galing si Dr. Jet. Diklar. Ara na? Okay. Wala si Doc Gabby at si... Doc, ano? Doc Gabby and... Doc Roslyn lang. Si Gabby. Can we have a screenshot na sang ama pictures nata ng natapos na kancur?